No. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mosai, King of all forefathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Yitzchak, and God of Yisrael, true, mighty, living, and only, the one who sees all and is unseen, the one who judges all and is not judged. We come before thee at this time, O Yah, to even say Torah Rabbah for all the food, the clothing, the shelter, the knowledge of who you are and who we are, even to even have a place set aside to study your word, to teach your word, and to become better men and women before their eyes. O great God and King of the house of Yisrael, Most High, rock of all salvations through every generation, we ask thee to even bless us, our families, those who know you, those who know you not, those who seek you, O Holy One of Yisrael. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. King, giving honor and praise to the Creator and the Maker of heaven and earth. My name is Yeshaya Yisrael of the tribe of Dan of the nation of Israel. This is another presentation brought to you from the congregation called Shema Yisrael, giving due respect to the leader and founder of the camp, Nasi Zipor. We want to sit there and also give a due acknowledgement to his son. Prince Natanel. We want to give due acknowledgement and respect to our beloved chief, Chief Natanel. Now, this particular teaching is called From Averis to Alabama. For those who may not know, Averis was a place that was in ancient Egypt. Alabama, as we know, is a place that is in what we call the United States of today. So this is something we just want to expound upon for edification purposes. All right. What you're looking at right here, brothers and sisters, is Genesis chapter 32, verse 29. And it reads as this in the Hebrew. And he said unto him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be said again as Jacob. For that which is definitely Israel, ki sarita im, because you have prevailed with God, with im anashim, and with man, watu call, and you are able. So these are just some things we want to show for edification purposes, and what that is talking about. All right, so we can gain some understanding of what we're speaking on. We're going to go on to the next slide. All right. Now, what you're looking at right here, brothers and sisters, says the word Israel. All right. And it says Israel is said as Yisrael from the root word Sarah. You can go into a Hebrew lexicon, page 739, the Ben Yehuda dictionary as well on page 305, when you look at it from the Hebrew to the English side. Israel is a compound word, Yisrael, from Yisra, the third person masculine singular. Future tense of the word Sara, or some say as Shara, all right? And the word El from the root word Ayil, which means to be mighty. So we want that to be noted for edification purposes and what we're speaking on. Let's go on to, to the next slide, my brother. This here 
All right, it says Deuteronomy 28, verse 32. The right side is where you see the English. All right, and it says, the word we see, la'el, means for power or to power. There is no might or power in your hand. That's what you read in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 32. The Hebrew on the right side, all right, brothers and sisters, says, Baneaka up no teka, and their two name, Laam Akir, we eneaka root, we kalot, alehem, call hayom, we ain la el yadeaka. In other words, the bow type that you see there on the right hand side in the Hebrew that says la el, the second and third letter says the word el. And as we see, it would mean either might or power. So now in many cases, you have it to where the word L is understood as we went over before as the word God. So we just want that to be noted for edification purposes. Go on to the next slide, my brother. What you're looking at here is referred to as the day and night steel. All right. Now, if you look at this PowerPoint very carefully, you will begin to see toward the um, right hand side of it in the white lettering or the bold part of it says Beit Dawid, Beit Yod Tau in ancient Hebrew and Dalet Wild Dalet spelling the word Dawid. All right. Now, for those who are Hebraically inclined and able to sit there and expand upon this, you're able to look and see that it actually also holds and denotes the word Yisrael above it. All right. So we just want this to be noted for edification purposes. Now, we want to get into the crux of what we're talking about in this particular regard. All right. And one of the things to point out, brothers and sisters, is this. And that is this is dated to the ninth century BCE in which it speaks about the house of David. So this is before the time of Herod. This is before the aspect of what happened with other people and their other teachings and so forth and so on house of Yisrael. This slide right here has been shown in certain reference books, certain archaeology books, and this was found in 1994. So when people say, oh, there's no external references in history about David in a book that was written in 1992, maybe this person didn't realize this was going to come to fruition and found out in archaeology. So that's something we want to point out for reference purposes. Let's go into the next slide, brother. Now, it says the matter of the Israelites and Egyptians in part. Now, this aspect will deal with the patriarch Joseph and the fact of Israelites being enslaved in Egypt. It will touch on linguistics and the matter of etymology. All right. The right side says this. The term Amu, sometimes spelled differently as A-A-M-U, meaning Asiatics extended to peoples outside of the eastern desert other terms referring to the western asiatics in history by the egyptians was such as the retenu the jahi set you and so forth joseph and the other israelites would have been in that term to the egyptians so this is something we want to point out for reference purposes they had the ancient egyptians now that is had generic terms that they called other people all right, so we can gain an understanding of what we're talking about. Next slide, my brother. What we're looking at here is called the Amu slash Asiatics and the Israel matter. On the left hand side, you see a pictured Pharaoh would be his queen or maybe your servant or so forth and so on in front of that. What I want to pay close attention to when you look at the picture on the left hand side with the people with the colorful clothes on. You will see one that's such as my complexion, for those who know me, and one that's the brother Josiah Ben Levy's complexion, if you look at very closely. It's not a white guy. It's a light-skinned black person. We want this to be pointed out for reference purposes and edification aspect. Then if you look underneath and see the people with the colorful clothes, some of them are pictured laying down or prostrating or paying homage, when you look at that particular aspect and that particular thing, what are we dealing with? Look at the guy that's on the bottom, all right? Facing the people that's prostrating. 
and look and see what's in the guy's hand if that's not a sickle or a knife. So are the people there paying homage or are they playing or praying, hoping that they won't be slain, for instance? Who knows? But it's just something I want to point out for reference purposes and so forth. But we also want to show to slay the Willie Lynch image inside the concept of the so-called conscious community that there were people of different shades and it was not due solely to mixing of different races. All right. Because not to sound racial or anything of that sort, when they say a light skinned people come from the mixture between um, white and black people, then I have to ask, where are the dark white people that came from it? If there are light skinned black people from interracial mixing, then by default, there should be dark skinned white people from interracial mixing. Just want to just throw that out there. Black people, so-called black people, are the only people on earth talking about they mix with somebody else. That's a whole nother different color or race or so forth. We're the only people doing that. But that's not the genre of this presentation, but we just want to talk on that particular subject. All right, next we got over here where you see the Egyptian writing on the right-hand side. This says Israel. Now, this is translated from the Menepta steel above says Israel, dated to the 13th century BC or BCE, 1205, according to many. The princes are prostrate, saying Shalom. Not one of the nine bowls lifts his head. Tijenu, which means Libya in modern terminology, is vanquished. Khati, which is the Hittites in modern terminology, at peace. Canaan is captive with all woe. Ashkelon is conquered. Gezir is seized. Yanoam made non existent. Yisrael is wasted, beer of seed. So we just wanted to point that out for reference purposes. Now, for those who are familiar with Egyptian terminologies, um, this is being read from right to left. Now, the human looking image that you see going toward on the right hand side of the picture, but looking toward going left toward it. The human looking image that you see shows that that is speaking about a particular people. All right. If this was shown more clearer, it would be for edification purposes. But we just want to go into that as we're going to go into this particular presentation. Next slide, please. Now, the matter of the Israel matter, the Menepta steel founded by Flinders Petrie in 1896 speaks of the Israelites in part. The matter that some debate is whether it belonged to Menepta himself of Dynasty 19 or to Amenhotep III of Dynasty 18. Some people are saying basically that Menepta put his name on the steel that Amenhotep III had. All right, that's one of the arguments concerning that particular thing there. Either way, we know that the L did not exist inside of ancient Egyptian language then. So the open mouth R is used in dealing in transliteration. All right. Now, when you look at all of the Pharaoh's names, we're speaking in the aspect from the first Pharaoh that's mentioned, such as Namur, said by some as Menes, all the way down to even the time when the um, Persians were ruling in Dynasty 31. None of the Pharaohs there um, have an L in their name because there's no L inside the Egyptian language. So when you read about the Ptolemy, which has the L in it in Dynasty 32 and so forth, that right there is just going to show that that was incorporated later on inside the Egyptian alphabet from the Greek influence or so forth, or in their transliteration. This is something we want to point out for reference purposes. All right, next slide, brother. What we're looking at right here, as stated, is even a clearer image of the um, thing that says a pharaoh mentions Israel. All right. And what we're looking at, reading it from the right to the left, is the flexion read doubled. That's the Y. Then you see going to the top of it, looking like a part version of a tic-tac-toe aspect. That's the actual aspect of the s in egyptian then the circular looking thing underneath it all right is the r the open mouth r as it is referred to as then you see what is referred to as the one flax and reed which makes the i sound i and y are said as two different aspects in hieroglyphic writing the bird looking thing in ancient 
aspect here is the aspect of A, the letter A. Then you see the open mouth R looking thing again next to the head of the bird, which represents the um, R. So this is Israel, all right, because there is no L inside of Egyptian language. So the R aspect is used in those days and times. We wanted to emphasize the aspect of showing what is referred to as the human looking thing, which shows it to be a person. The three things underneath that um, shows it where it says his seed is not. So it's talking about a group or conglomerate of people that was called Israel, as stated. Some people debate whether it was from Manepta or from a predecessor of his named Amenhotep III. But the House of Israel is going to leave that alone to the committee, who have you, and we're going to go along. Next slide, please. What we're looking at here is a thing called Asiatic captives in Egypt. Now, the one on the left-hand side is dated to the era of the timing of Ramses, all right? And on the right-hand side, some people state that that's dated to Dynasty Five of the Old Kingdom of Egypt, and some people say that that's dated to the aspect of the, um, the Middle Kingdom of Egypt. But regardless of that particular aspect, if you look very closely, when you have your arms tied behind you, as shown near, or your arms even, unfortunately, even an American rest, arrest, they put your hands or your arms behind your back. That's being your captive. You're taken into captivity. <laughs> That's what that is. It's not your friend. So we want to show that for evidence purposes, all right? So, okay, we want to um, go on to the next slide. All right. What we're looking at in this particular case and in this particular aspect, all right, the matter of Joseph. It is important to know that the timeline, not of the Bible, but of the Egyptian sources, is what is not in sequence. The Joseph story reflects the conditions of the second millennium BCE, when it was not unheard of for a Semite to rise to power in an Egyptian court. This second paragraph I got from a book called Understanding the Old Testament by Bern Bard Anderson, all right, third edition. So I'm citing my source verbally in that regard. The timeline we're speaking of dates to the 12th dynasty of Egypt. So we want to emphasize upon that. Remember, this is called from Averis to Alabama. All right, let's go on to the next slide, please. Now it says Joseph in the matter of famine. Let's go in. In the tomb of the officer named Ameni, we see the following. No one was unhappy in my days, not even in the years of famine. For I had tilled all the fields of the Nome of Ma up to its southern and northern frontiers. Thus I prolonged the lives of its inhabitants and produced food which it produces. No hungry man was in it. I distributed equally to the widow and the married woman. Now, this is dated, all right, to the era of Senusrit or Sesostris said by some, all right, of Dynasty 12, all right? So it speaks about the aspect of a famine. So we want to show the correlation between the biblical aspect when we read about a famine in there and a famine that you see inside of ancient Egypt in that particular aspect. Remember, the timeline of the Egyptian aspect with the Pharaonic kings and so forth is what's not always in sequence. Okay, let's go on to the next slide, please. Joseph and Egypt. The time frame we are speaking of is during the era of Senusrit II of Egypt. We should bear in mind that it was not a long time between the death of Joseph and the enslavement of the Israelites under a pharaoh who did not know Joseph. As written in the scriptures, there arose a new king over Egypt who knew not Joseph. So we just want to point that out for reference purposes. All right? Joseph was given the names of not Panea, which in Egyptian is more so said as Jijidineph, which means he who is called. All right. The term Aniya is the Egyptian for the, is the Hebrew, pardon me. The term Aniya is the Hebrew for the Egyptian Ankh, meaning life. And Anku means that which is alive. So therefore, we can see the Neptunach be Anku means he who is called, he who brings to life. So we just want to point that out for reference purposes. Now, the aspect where I got that from comes from a guy named Kenneth Kitchen in one of the books that he wrote. All right, so let's go on to the next slide, please. Joseph and the Hyksos matter. Yes, 
as many Israelites teach, the only time in which a Shemite, not to be conf not some people say yes, Sem, but it's really Shemite, all right? Which in which a Shemite would have respect to raise to prominent status was during the time of the Hyksos era. The matter is that Joseph was in the time of the first wave of the Hyksos, doing what is referred to as Dynasty 11. Remember, we are speaking about Joseph and saying that he is was during the time of Egyptian timeline of Dynasty 12. There was Asiatics who were later on referred to in history as Hyksos in Egypt prior to the time of Salatis, prior to the time of what happened in Dynasty 15. All right. So we want to go into that particular aspect. And then it had the first was the first ruler of Dynasty 12, and he built what is referred to as the walls of the prince or the walls of the ruler. And this was to keep out the Amu or the Asiatics from Egypt. That means they had to be in Egypt already. What am I getting into? The first pharaoh of Dynasty 12, who ruled after um, Hotep IV, according to some, depends on what king's list you're looking at, right? Or ruled concurrent with him also. Now, one of the things to point out is this particular pharaoh, Amenahat the first, built what is referred to as the walls of the ruler or the walls of the prince. This goes to show you to keep out the Asiatics from going into Egypt. Jacob was part of the Amu, according to the eyes of the Egyptians, who would have been part of the wave of Asiatics, aka the Amu or the Setu or the Retenu that went into the land of Mizraim or Egypt. So we want to point that out for reference purposes. All right. So next slide, please. OK, the Israelites and the Egyptians. Exodus chapter one, verse seven and 11 says the following. All right. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty. And the land was filled with them. Therefore, they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh store cities. says. Now, that's from the scriptures itself. On the right-hand side, we see the following. Egypt, Canaan, and Israel by Donald Redford. And he says the following. One can be led to believe that in time, the Asiatic population of the Eastern Delta grew to exceed in number the native Egyptian stock. What are we saying? As the scriptures points out that the land was filled with the children of Israel and it says that they were abundant and multiplied and waxed the seeming mighty. Then when you can take it to a college reference source that some people use, one of the things that says in a book entitled Egypt, Canaan and Israel in Ancient Times by Donald Redford, he is saying one can be led to believe that in, that in time, meaning in a process of time, all right, the Asiatic population of the Eastern Delta Asiatic, such as the Shemite, Hebrew, Habiru people, the Apiru people, okay, follow along, population of the Eastern Delta grew to exceed in number the native Egyptian stock. So there were more Asiatics, if you will, in the Eastern Delta of Egypt than the native Egyptian people that were in of their own land. This is something we want to point out for reference purposes. Sources from secular re from secular reasons. Now, next slide, brother. When we say sources from secular reasons, it's due to the fact that people be like, well, you know, the Israelites they always only deal with the Bible, and the Israelites only deal with the Bible. So in this case, we want to sit there and show references from other reasons, other reasons. All right. Asian slaves, whether plentiful, pardon me. Asian slaves became plentiful in wealthy Egyptian households. Encyclopedia Britannica, 1964. Another source. There is evidence from Tel El Daba that a community of Asiatics existed in Egypt in Dynasty 13. Oxford, History of Ancient Egypt. Next part says this the BR, period MU, meaning the Brooklyn Museum Papyrus demonstrate clearly the presence in Egypt's middle kingdom of a sizable Asiatic population of servile status, presumably brought back as a result of foreign wars. So we want this to be noted for evidence purposes that when it says whether um, one source saying became plentiful in wealthy Egyptian households, Asian slaves, not talking about the people like Japan or China, 
no offense to like the Vietnamese or the Cambodians, that's not what it talks about when it says Asian. It's talking about Western Asia, such as the Egyptian terminologies as set your retenu and so forth and so on. So now we wanted to show reference purposes from other re sources so we can sit there and demonstrate our point so people won't say you're only using the bible no we're not only using the bible but if we were to we will be within our right as the house of israel you cannot tell a brother or sister to sit there and not use a source you don't have the authority nor do you have the rightful jurisdiction to say what sources can be used when we're presenting an argument if you disagree with us then you'll disagree with our source and you just be a disagreeable person that's up to you. But we want to present our sources biblically and externally so that way it can be noted for edification purposes. All right, next slide, please. Remember, this is called from Averis to Alabama. The matter of the Pharaoh of the Exodus. And there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage. Then it says in another part, this is now going into Exodus chapter 3 and chapter 4, all the men who sought your life have died. So the left-hand side is biblical citations, all right? And then we see this on the right-hand side. The Exodus occurred not in the new kingdom under Ramses, but under Neferhotep the first of the middle kingdom. The body of such Pharaoh was not found. His son did not replace him, but his brother did, who by the name was Sihathor. So we just want to point that out for reference purposes and for edification reasoning. All right. We're going to go on now to the next slide. And it says this. Tut against the Asiatics. Now, what you're looking at here very meticulously, okay, is a picture is a picture of tut being shown attacking the asiatics now whether or not some people say the asiatics that's being shown under the horse were aramean aka syrian or whether or not they were actually the israelites in certain cases that remains to be seen and so forth however we wanted to be known and shown that the egyptians no offense to them as a people of color were not for being what you can understand as being called pro-black all right because pro-black people do not show black people being attacked by that kind of aspect and so forth all right so we can gain an understanding of what we're dealing with and what we're talking about we're going to go on to the next slide brother All right, for edification purposes. Ramses against the Asiatics. What you're looking at right here, brothers and sisters, right, is a picture of Ramses being shown holding the hair of three black men. And he's going to either scalp them or cut them from their neck or so forth they're not friends of black people in the ancient world this was not painted by greeks later on under the era of the ptolemies neither so we just want this to be shown some people state that the image that you see to the far left is a kushite or ethiopian and the middle one is an asiatic and then the one over there to the other side is also an asiatic they're all still men of color so the mythology that ancient egyptians was like this pro-black type of people is actually um false all right so we want that to be noted we're going to go into the next slide brother it says sources on slaves in egypt because we want to cite our citations all right in another case a wife was left for amu asiatic slaves now, what you're reading on the left-hand top point there is coming from a book written by Sir Alan Gardiner entitled Egypt of the Pharaohs. All right, then let's go on to the next part. Not until the Middle Kingdom is there evidence of Nubians and Asiatics at the, as domestic slaves in Egypt. 
all right, that's written by a person named Leslie David, all right, in that particular aspect. The name of the book I'm going to put inside the um, um, comment section, all right? I'm going to cite all the sources in the comment section so that way people can, you know, see where we get our citations from concerning this kind of presentation, all right? There is evidence from Tel El Daba that a community of Asiatics existed early in the 13th dynasty. There is also references to camps of Asiatic workmen. And you see Shaw, that's Ian Shaw. And he wrote a book for Oxford, Oxford History of Ancient Egypt. So that's certainly Oxford University is one of the most heavily cited sources for evidence purposes besides Cambridge or besides Princeton or so forth. So we can gain an understanding what we're talking about. We're citing collegiate sources. Now, that doesn't mean that everything that comes out of a college is true, but you can still check the references yourself. OK, we're going to go on to the next slide. So we're going to sit there and show what this reason and purpose is. This is what we spoke about before with the Brooklyn Papyrus. All right. It says this, the Asiatic woman, Menahem, the Asiatic woman, Shifra, a weaver of linen, the Asiatic woman, Asher. She is called Wer in Tef, a weaver. What are we dealing with? We already went over the fact that the Asiatics were known as the Setu or the Retenu or the Amu inside of Egyptian records. So now when you read words like Shifra, Menahem, Asher, those were Hebrew names. Menahem in Hebrew means one who obtained compassion. Shifra, or right from the Hebrew root word, um, shafar, basically, shifra means a good tail or that which is pretty or beautiful in Hebrew. Asher in Hebrew means happiness. So we want that to be noted for reference purposes. The source comes from ancient Near East in text part two by Pritchard. You can get that book on Amazon. So we're not just citing the Bible only. We want that to be noted for reference purposes. All right. So we can get this understanding out there to the people. All right. Let's go on to the next slide, my brother. We're going to show the translations that we're speaking of in part concerning what is called the Brooklyn Museum Papyrus. Now, no disrespect intended, I had to sit there and at one time I was at work one night and a two hour discussion debate online on Facebook, okay, granted, and um, with somebody saying, no, there were no Hebrew slaves in Egypt. There were no Hebrew slaves in Egypt. So I said, brother, did you ever look up the Brooklyn Museum Papyrus 35.1446? So when he looked it up after two hours of discussing and I'm working the 12 to 8 shift. So now it's like 2 a.m. going on 3 a.m. or so. And then you guys, oh, well, yeah, well, he was slaves in Egypt. Why didn't you just look it up from before? As I found it, so can you, if you care to debate, but you have the debate spirit. So it doesn't allow you to sit there and cite a source or look up a source. Because the only thing you do is just question. You cannot, and I'm saying this as a brother, a black man, a friend, you cannot say, end quote, all right, believe nothing, question everything. Why? Because if you run into the truth of something, you're still under the premise of believe nothing, question everything. So when do you find the truth? It says Asiatic woman, Rehui, is called Kaipu Nebi, whopper of cloth. Asiatic woman, Aquaba. She is called Resinebwa, whopper, whopper, sorry, of cloth. Asiatic woman, Anath. She is called Ayun Etan, whopper of cloth. Asiatic woman, Haimni, Haimi. She is called, and is not translated, weaver of linen. Asiatic woman, Menahem. She is called, not translated, weaver of linen. Asiatic woman, Sekratu. She is called Wordit Nidnub, weaver of linen. Asiatic woman, Imi Sukuru. She is called Seneb Sen Usert, weaver of linen. Asiatic woman, An, and then the brackets you see there is what they're saying. They understand it to mean in, the, in that. She is called Nub M. Merkis, weaver of linen. Asiatic woman, Baal Tuya. She is called Wareseneb, worker, work staff, Asiatic male, 
Sue, and then the rest of the name is not there. So the point in showing all of this is to show good and well, this is part of the translation, and you actually see Asiatic women and Asiatic male. Some who are cooks, some who are house slaves, some who make clothes for the Egyptians, and so forth and so on. So we want this to be noted for reference purposes. All right? The Israelite record is the only known record of them being enslaved by the Egyptians. Then you have, as we went over the Brooklyn Museum papyrus that was found inside of ancient Egypt, showing the Asiatics as slaves documented. Hyksos and the Israelites. It should be noted that the captivity and exodus of the Israelites from Egypt predated the takeover of Egypt by the known Hyksos who set up Dynasty 15. All right. The Hyksos were called Haku Sosret, said by some as Hekakasu. Asiatics in Egypt go back to Dynasty 5 and even before that and what is referred to as the Scorpion Dynasty. However, the praised matter of the Hyksos taken over was after the Israelites left Egypt. They were, in history, called the Amalekites. So we want this to be noted for reference purposes and what we're talking about. All right. Were there any Israelites among who is referred to as Hyksos? Yes. Were all the Hyksos Israelites? No. Now, we spoke about the Amalekite Hyksos, right? Now, when you go in the Torah in the book of Exodus 17, it speaks about the aspect of what happened when the Israelites were in the wilderness. And it says the children of Amalek attacked the Israelites. Now, the word Amalek, Amal, Amalek in Hebrew means what, brothers and sisters? What does it mean? Da -da 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 -da, warlike. So we want that to be noted for reference purposes. Look at the picture there on either side and you see what is referred to. Some say locks, some say actual braids that's twisted up or so forth. So we just want that to be noted. The Amalekites were part in part of the house of Edom, E-D-O-M. The Edomites too, like the Israelites, descended from Abraham. When you read in the record of Ramses III, you read about the children of Esau and the Anastasi papyrus. So Abraham had to exist for the Edomites to exist. The ancient Egyptians did not deny the existence of the ancient Israelite ancestors. The conscious community has a lot of answering to do. So we just want this to be pointed out for reference purposes. All right, let's go in, brothers and sisters. Now, what you're looking at right here is a picture that I want to explain to the people in part. All right? Exodus 11, verse 3, in the matter of a pharaoh. And it says this. And the Most High gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. All right. Now, it says Moses was great in the sight of the people. The pharaoh that you see there pictured is said by some scholars and some historians to be the actual image of Moshe or Moses, but with having the name and man had the fourth. He was not the son of a pharaoh when you read about this particular one. And he ruled a little longer than nine years. So we just want that to be noted. There are many who actually state that particular case of such. All right. So let's go on into this. But by the way, I want to go into a particular aspect to show this. When you're looking at this particular thing right here, this particular pharaoh was brought to a man that had the third by a female by the name of Sobek Nefru of Dynasty 12, who was the last ruler of that. So Bek Nefru of ancient Egypt was a woman who ruled after Amenahat the fourth. So no offense when they start saying that Hapsetsit is the first female ruler. She's not. Egypt had a female ruler as stated in Dynasty 12 named So Bek Nefru. And before that, there was a woman named Konkus in Dynasty 4 or 5 of Egypt. All right. So we want this to be pointed out for reference purposes. Next, we're going to go into this. Now. A captive in the middle kingdom of Egypt, as we see in this picture right here. I want to show for evidence purposes on what we're talking about and what we're seeing. All right. This is from 
actually the Hecht Museum inside of Egypt. Now you're looking at it from different angles. Needless to say, this person is actually a little blacker than me. And his hair, Roy type. And as we see, unfortunately, he's shown being tied up. He's a captive. But they're saying that this was a captive in the MK, that is to say the Middle Kingdom of Egypt. So the Egyptians were not actually friends of the International Board of Black People, if you want to use that term. All right? The Israelites. One point to make is that the Israelites, as known, descended from two Shemitic nations, Aram and Chaldea. Both these people are noted to be of the Negroid or Negro type in history. According to Muller in his book, Ancient Hebrews and Arabs, the excavations done at Lachish, which was a place in Judah, show that the Judean people had the skulls in the genotype of the Negro family of peoples. All right, so you can go and get a book entitled Ancient Hebrews and Arabs by Gert Muller online. All right, the author's last name is pitched, is mentioned there, so you can cite the reference itself. All right, so we can gain an understanding of what we're talking about. All right, now, as stated, this is called From Averis to Alabama. So we spoke about the Israelites in history, external references, and so forth and so on. All right, so now we're going into this. A matter in the time of David. A Hebrew inscription found around the aspect of the era of David. It was found in 2008 and thus confirmed the fact that Israel did not only exist, but were writers as well. This is found in the area of Bethlehem. All right, so we can know what this is talking about. Bethlehem is also the place where David came from. All right, let's go in concerning the aspect and part concerning David. It says this, the Armana aspect in King David. Say to Yan Hamu, my lord, message of Mutaba'al, your servant. He has hidden Ayab. As the king, my lord, lives, I swear Ayab is not in Pella. Just ask Benem Ima, Dadua, Yeshua. And that is to say, instead of the Akkadian dialect, um, Benem Ima is Benaya, Dadua is David, and Yeshua is Jesse or Yeshai in Hebrew. So we want that to be noted for evidence purposes. All right. The proceeding was from the Armano records and is in a British museum entitled EA256. So we want to cite our sources for what we're talking about and so forth. The Armana aspect in King David part two. The Armana record, the city of Gezer is in the hands of the Canaanite rulers such as Mil Hilu, then Yapuhu. Now we just want to show what this is talking about in this particular aspect. I'm going to ask the brother Josiah Ben Levy to read in 1 Kings chapter 9 verse 15. All right, so we can read about an aspect with Gezer and so forth. All right, we are in First Kings chapter 9, verse 15. All right, thank you, my brother. We're in the book of Kings. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And this is the account of the, of the, Le the levy which King Solomon raised to build the house of Jehovah. And to build his own. And Milo and the war of Jerusalem and Hazor, Hazor, Sika, and Megiddo, Megiddo, and Gezer. Now, the reason why I asked the brother to read that is because in the scriptures in the Tanakh, it speaks about the aspect of Gezer. Now, when it says the levy that he rose up to build this particular thing is talking about the aspect that happened during the time of Solomon. Traces of this rebuilding have been found in a form of characteristic Solomonic masonry. Now we say masonry, we're not talking about secret society. We're talking about the aspect of somebody building something. All right, so we can gain an understanding of what we're talking about. Next slide, brother. Now, the Armana aspect and King David part three. And it says this. 
Abdi Heba, a king who ruled in Jerusalem, said this. As my king lives, lost are the lands of the king. All the governors are lost. Let the king send out archers and troops. The Habiru plunder all the lands of the king. This is from the Armana Records, EA 286. Abdi Heba is the last king of Jerusalem before David took it after ruling in Hebron. What are we present also is the Armana Records, brothers and sisters, is a correspondence between the Canaanites and a pharaoh by the name of Akhenaten of Dynasty 18. So therefore, Akhenaten, when you look at the record, not from the Egyptian um, biased aspect, but world history and showing how writings and kings and leaders and peasants and servants all correlated one with another, you would have to sit there and show and know and understand that the timeline given of Egypt dating all the way back, they say 10,000 BCE cannot be accurate. Why? Because they're using, in certain cases, the Manetholus, the Abadalus, um, Abydos list, sorry, the Saqqara list in the Royal Tour and Papyrus of Dynasty um, 20. But then if that be the case, how do you get the kings that ruled in Dynasty in the late kingdom? How do you get the kings that ruled in what they call later on the um, intermediate period? So do you just want this to be shown for reference purposes? All right. Because they have a king's list in ancient Egypt that goes one king, two king, second king, third king, even though people see, even such as Eusebius wrote that there was different pharaohs ruling at the same time, they don't always show the king list with them ruling at the same time in different parts of the same country. So the timeline, neglecting that aspect is pushed back. So now use an Egyptian aspect as a catalyst and blindfold saying everything must correlate to Egyptian timeline, neglecting the fact that Egyptian timeline given does not show co-regencies among the different pharaohs. One is dealing with biasness. This is how we teach in Shema Yisrael. All right. Next, we got glory to the Most High. Jerusalem was allotted to Benjamin and Joshua. But Judges 121 tells us that Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites or the Yebusim, which was part of the Canaanite nation. So we just want that to be noted for evidence purposes. All right. Next slide. Beginning to the kings of Israel and Judah. All right. So we can gain an understanding of what we're talking about. In Mizpeh, powerful fortifications built by Asa have been found. Asa was one of the kings that ruled in Judah. The source of that comes from a book actually entitled The Israelites. The author is Thames, T-H-A-M-E-S. You can get that book on Amazon. The name of that book is called The Israelites Itself. Okay, and it says in Mizpeh, powerful fortifications built by Asa have been found. Scholars debate, quote, unquote, whether the other fortifications were made by Hezekiah or Rehoboam, both of them being kings of Judah. Both Hezekiah and Rehoboam had matters with the Egyptians. To Hawker and Hezekiah era is Shishak in the era of Rehoboam. So we just want this to be noted. Now, let's look at the list of kings that rule that you read of in the scriptures on the right hand side. Ahab, Omri, Yehu, Menahem, Hosea, Pekwa, Ahaz, Yehoiachin, Manasseh, Hezekiah, kings of Israel slash Judah mentioned by other nations. So let's go and understand what we're talking about. Ahab, king of Israel, is mentioned by Shalmanasar the third of Assyria. The same king of Assyria mentions Omri. The same king of Assyria mentions Yehu. All right. They actually have a thing which they refer to as the black obelisk of Yehu bowing down to the king of Assyria for his wickedness. Menahem is mentioned by the Assyrian king Tiglat Pelassar III. The same king Tiglat Pelassar III mentions Hosea, mentions also Pekha. All right. Also mentions Ahaz, said as Yaho Ahaz. So we want that to be noted. Jehoiachin of Judah is mentioned by Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon in his record. Manasseh is mentioned by Esarhaddon of Assyria, one of the kings that ruled right above the era of Ashur Benipal. And Hezekiah is mentioned by the Egyptian king Sennacherib. This is how he teaches Shema Yisrael. Glory to the Most High. 
Reason why we're doing this in part is to have teachings out there so that way for one, edification purposes and how to maturely represent a debate aspect once it comes down to certain cases. All right, let's go more to the next slide so we can show certain things in this particular case. All right, the matter of Omri. Okay, the left-hand side, we see this, Omri. He was one of the kings of Israel, and he was the father to Ahab. Both Omri and Ahab are mentioned by the Assyrians. Omri, too, is mentioned in the book of Micah in the Bible. All right? What you're looking at on the right-hand side is ancient Hebrew writing that dates to the time of Omri. You're not going to have a record that says in the Bible that the Assyrians defeated the Israelites, and then the Assyrian record saying they defeated the Israelites and both the lion. No nation is going to get paid off to be recorded as getting beat up and found their daughters and their future descendant females because men could be macho, all right? No, I wouldn't want my daughter to know that I got defeated unless it's an actual truth. I'm not going to sit there and tell my daughter a lie that, yeah, baby, I got beat down. No, you don't make up a story, all right, of catching a beat down to your granddaughters. You're supposed to have it to where they look up to you. So we just want that to be noted. So the fact Israel's record and Assyria's record both speak about Israel catching a beat down shows that it's pretty accurate. The Bible doesn't say Assyria is lying. And Assyria is like, yeah, we, we, we smashed Judah. Like, that's what it is. So we just, not to sound streetish or disrespectful, we just want that to be noted for edification purposes. Here's the picture we was talking about. Me going on to the next slide. All right. Yehu, king of Israel. All right, as you see post him postrated, it said the tribute of Yehu said as Iowa inside of the Assyrian aspect. Son of Omri, Omri, I received from him silver gold, a golden vase with pointed bottom, tin, a staff for a king. In layman terms, brothers and sisters, Yehu is shown prostrating after he essentially got hijacked or robbed. For those not trying to sound offensive, he got juxt, to put it in so many terms, and it's being spoken of right there. It speaks about Israel, the nation of Israel, being spoiled in the book of Isaiah. These are the kind of things that we're talking about historically. But remember, this is from Averis 2. This is from Averis to Alabama. So we know where we leading with this one, all right? Uzziah, Uzziah, king of Judah. The annals of Tiglat Pelesar III identify the leader of this effort as Azrayu of Judah. Atlas of the Bible by Reader's Digest speaks about this particular case, all right? The actual inscription that you're seeing on the left-hand side, written in what is referred to as like modern Hebrew writing, is actually ancient Aramaic writing because at one point, Aramaic was known as the lingua franca of the area, all right? So we want that to be noted for evidence purposes. What we're dealing with in this particular part and aspect right here, we're going to go on to the next slide. It says, Hebrew matter in the time of Hezekiah and Hebron, a Levitical city, all right? This is important in the fact that Hebron was a Levitical city, and Hezekiah, when you go into the book of Chronicles, commissioned the Levites to teach what is right, all right? Also, this shows Hebrew writing by Israel prior to the timing of Herod the Edomite, all right? So we just want that to be noted for reference purposes. Now, what you're looking at in this particular case, all right, the... Some refer to as the Bidu and so forth. But the writing that's under it, remember Hebrews read from right to left. You're looking at what is referred to as the Beit or the B sound, the Resh or the R sound, and in ancient Hebrew, what is referred to as the Noon. All right? So we want that to be noted. It says in part Kebron. All right? So we want that to be noted for reference purposes. Kebron is Hebron in Hebrew. Kebron from Kabir. Kaber mean a friend from Kabar, which essentially means to embrace or to tie. All right, now we're going to go on to the next part.
in this particular case and in this particular aspect. All right. So let's go on in this particular case. Next slide, please. Manasseh, king of Judah. I called up the kings of the country of Hati and on the other side of the Euphrates. Balu, king of Tyre. Manasseh said as men say Manasseh, king of Judah, I.D. So we're speaking, this is the aspect of Esarhaddon of Assyria. Both Esarhaddon and Ashur Nepal mention Manasseh among their vassals. All right, that comes from a source called Bible Dictionary by Grant and Rowley, page 616. All right, so we wanted to cite our sources in that particular case. And we also cited Ancient Near Eastern Text, Volume 1 by Pritchard, page 201. All right, Esau Dome mentions both Manasseh and this particular Manasseh being the king of Judah. Note, brothers and sisters, that Judah said inside the Assyrian aspect does not drop the D. That becomes important for another video. All right. The matter of the Assyrians, Moab and Judah. Tribute from Ammon, two menus of gold, Moab. One menu of gold, Judah, 10 menus of silver. All right, 10 menus is approximately 5,000 pounds of silver. Gold and silver was used as commerce. Now, what you're seeing right there is referred to in a writing form. Some say perhaps cuneiform, someone may try to say that's the aspect of what is referred to as the Assyrian writing. However, one of the things you want to get into. In this particular case is that it mentions Judah actually giving substance of Judah to the Assyrians. Okay, we want to go on to the next slide for edification purposes, all right, so we can gain an understanding of what we're talking about in this particular case. Tiglath going in on Israel. What are we looking at here? Tiglath pillar saw the third, that is, and the images that they show of them going against the tribes of Israel of the Northern Kingdom. Another aspect of Sennacherib taking the city of Lachish. You can actually go on Google Images, if you care to use the Google aspect, and type in Sennacherib of Assyria and Hezekiah of Judah. Then click on Images and you will see these kind of images come up. Note very carefully on the left-hand side of the picture, the people that are prostrating the style of here that they have. Just want to make that reference point. All right. Tiglat boasts of such. Now, here's what Tiglat Pilasar had to say in the next slide. All right, brother, concerning this particular case right here. As for Menahem, I overthrew him like a snowstorm, and he fled like a bird alone. I imposed on him tribute, gold, silver, linen garments, and multicolored trimmings. I overthrew their king Pekka. And I'll place Hosea as king over them. I received from them 10 talents of gold and an un amount of, of silver. And the X amount meaning unknown. So at the bottom, I typed, um, the Bible's made up question mark. When you go into the book, brothers and sisters of 2 Kings 15, you read about Menahem, king of the northern tribes of Israel, taking things from the rich people among ancient Israel to give it to the king of Assyria as a tribute. All right, so now we want to go and show this particular aspect in the next particular slide right here. Next slide, brother. Assyria and the Israelites. Now, what you're looking at is two different aspects of two different pictures. One from the wall and one from the aspect of it shown in color. Brothers and sisters, the people that are being shown, if you're not trying to be racial or anything like that, they're being shown with what we today refer to as cornrows. Okay, so we just want that to be known for edification purposes. So let's go on, if we will, to the next slide. Thank you for that. Here we see Assyria and the Israelites, part two, being led from the Judean city of Lachish into the Assyrian captivity. Point being is that the Israelites are shown, even by the enemies of the Israelites, 
as having Negroid style aspect that we went over before. And you can still, when you ever you get the time or concern, the book that we went over before by Gert Muller, Ancient Hebrews and Arabs. All right. So let's go on to the next slide, brothers and sisters. What we're looking at right here is referred to as Ahaz's Bula. A bula is basically like a seal impression from clay or a rock or so forth in which you actually see um, writing on it. It says this in translation. To Ahaz, king of Judah, the son of Jotam, king of Judah. All right? Ahaz is mentioned by the Assyrian king Telak Pelassar III. T-I-G period P-I-L. He was also known as King Pulu in Babylon, but that's another subject. Ahaz is the king that is spoken of in Isaiah 7 about the birth of Emmanuel. So we just want that to be noted for edification purposes. All right? So we want to show another aspect. Next slide, brother. This is referred to as the Assyrians and the Israelites. All right? Yet again, the Assyrian kings who are important to the Israelites are as follows. Adad Narari III, Shamanesar III, Tiglat Pelesar III, Shalmanesar the fifth, Sargon the second, Sennacherib, as well as Esarhaddon. After that era, the Assyrians began to fall to the Babylonians. So the Israelites was caught in the wave storm of the kingdoms that was going on at that time. The Israelites' duty was to stay loyal to the Most High and keep his laws, statutes, and commandments. But what does Ahaz do? He bows down to the gods of Assyria. What does Manasseh do? He sits there and delves in witchcraft. What does Jehoiakim do? Tell Jeremiah the prophet to get out his face, essentially. So the Israelites were not in keeping with the laws, statutes, and commandments as they was and should have been doing. So we want to go on to the next slide in this particular regard. Next slide, brother. What we're looking at here is referred to as the Lachish letters. In translation, it says this. To Eliashib, the word of the king is incumbent on you for your very life. Behold, I have sent to warn you today. Ramat Negev has to be defended. At least Edom should come there. So what we're looking at in this particular case, brothers and sisters, and when you read about the Lachish letters, is dated to the era of the 6th century BCE. So Lachish, as we went over, is a land in the tribe of Judah. You can look that up inside of a concordance and then see it in the book of Joshua, chapter 15 to Joshua, chapter 19. Then, all right. Now, one of the things to point out is this is dated to the era around Jeremiah, but the Hebrew writing was known before the time of Herod. See, what happens is sometimes they'll say, Can you show me any Hebrew inscription or any Hebrew writing before Herod? Well, the Lachish letters be an example of that. So we just want this to be noted for edification purposes. Next slide, please. What we're looking at here is referred to as the Fos Temple. All right. The Fos Temple was located in the area of Lachish in Judah. The excavations show that the people looked like the following picture shown there. This is dated to ancient Israel under the era of Hezekiah of Judah. And not to be racial, when you look and see the facial structures and features of that in some aspects of what is referred to as the African man or woman, it ain't too far-fetched. The Israelites at one time by the Romans was called Ethiopians. All right, so we just want that to be known for reference purposes. Next slide, please. What we're looking at here is called Arad in the Hebrew matter. And this says in translation, to my Lord Eliashib, may YHWH, may Yahweh, may Yehoah, may Yah, seek your welfare. As to the matter what you command me, it is well. He is in the house of your hey, wow, hey. The Arad writing also dates to the 6th century BCE. That is to say before Persia really came to power and then by default before the aspect of Greece came to power, which also by default means that before the aspect in time, before Rome came to power. And Rome came to power inside the land of Israel during the time of Pompeii. Herod 
was the son of Antipater. Antipater was friends with like Julius Caesar and so forth. So when they're asking Israelites to show Hebrew writings before the aspect of Herod, we can go to the Lachish letters. We can go to also to the aspect of the Arad matter. Now, when you look at this in translation in your own particular time, you will see that the YHWH or the Yod Hey Wah Hey was known in Israel prior to the timing of the Masoretic text. All right. So we just want that to be known for edification purposes. We're going to go on to the next slide in this particular regard. Next slide, please. All right. What we're looking at here says aspects of what existed in a name. Okay. In the name, sorry. The holy name has been found in excavations from Arad and Gedi, Jerusalem, Lachish, Kirbit, Beit Lai, as well as a place called Diban. When you look up archaeology in those following lands, it will show you the actual records and writings that existed there that show the name YHWH, all right? One may want to look up what is referred to as the Silver Scrolls in regards to singing the holy name from ancient days because most of the people who attempt to say, and I say this in no disrespect, I'm sorry how it may be taken, we want to still come respectfully and maturely, and mature, sorry, is this. The people who say that the YHWH or Yod Hey Wah Hey is something that is created by the master rites or anything of that sort have to then explain how do you find it inside of ancient writings. And I ask this, and I say this in no disrespect to any Israelite who say that the Yod Hey Wah Hey or the YHWH is not the phonetic names for the God of, for the phonetic letters for the name of the God of Israel is how do you say I am the Lord your God in Hebrew because if you're saying no offense that the holy name is Ahaya or Ehye which literally means I will be some say it as I am in translation that means anytime somebody's saying I am this or I am that are you saying that is you the holy name no but we know good and well not to call ourselves YHWH as a name all right, so we want that to be noted for reference purposes. Next slide, please. We want to get into continuing in this particular matter. This is referred to as the Elephantine matter, all right? It says from the Aramaic writing and translation, to our Lord Bagoas, governor of Judah, your servants, Yedaniah, and his colleagues, the priests who are at the fortress of Elephantine, May the God of heaven seek the welfare of our Lord. So it shows a couple of things. The Elephantine matter in writing dates to the 5th century BCE. All right? Some say to the 6th century BCE. But it's still before the era of Greece coming into power under Alexander. All right? So we want this to be pointed out for reason and purposes. Now, it says to our Lord, lowercase l, Bagoas, governor of Judah. Judah existed prior to the timing of the Greek rulership all right your servants yedoniah yedonia meaning the most high will judge and his colleagues the priests who are at the fortress of elephantine which is in southern egypt by the first cataract made a god of heaven shows you that the people in the ancient world were not atheists black people did not learn how to pray and call on the god of heaven by slavery and the slave master through christianity that's not how it came about so we want this to be noted our ancestors were not i state no offense intended to anyone were not atheists all right we just read right there where it says may the god of heaven therefore atheism is not a concept of our people black people color people and certainly not the house of Israel. all right we're going to go on to the next slide to get back into the biblical aspect next slide please Jeremiah chapter 44, verse 1 through 2. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the Jews that dwell in the land of Egypt, that dwell in Migdol, and at Tapanhes, and at Noph, and in the country of Pathros, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, ye have seen all the evil that I have brought upon Jerusalem and upon all the cities of Judah. And behold, this day they are a desolation, 
and no man dwelleth therein. The matter of the Israelites from Elephantine can be found in a book called Hebrewisms of West Africa by Joseph Williams. All right, another book entitled Ancient Egypt. All right, that is to say Atlas of Ancient Egypt by people named Baines and Malek. All right, as stated at the end of this, I'm going to cite in the comment board all the sources that I'm using. All right, extra biblical sources for Hebrew history written by a guy named Mercer, as well as a book entitled Ancient Near Eastern Text. That's four different references that speak about the Israelites being in Egypt. Israel, when fleeing from the enemies, ran to places that we currently call within a continent known as Africa. So we just want that to be noted for edification purposes. Next slide, please, so we can see what we're talking about a little clearer. Thank you, brother. It says this, the matter with Elephantine. What we're looking at is a map, and it says Elephantine, colony of Jewish mercenaries and Persian service in the fifth century, where a temple of Yahweh disappeared after 401. All right, so that's in the writing right there where you see those two lines, the green one and the orange or yellowish looking one in that particular case. Let's read this again. It says this, Elephantine, colony of Jewish mercenaries in Persian service in the fifth century. So we want this to be noted for edification purposes. The fifth century means that it's 400 something BCE. All right, so this is a map. If you look where the water is going, on the right hand side of the um slide that's part of the red sea that leads to the gulf of aquaba and so forth so we want this to be shown in a map aspect all right next slide brothers and sisters thank you brother what we just shown came from a book called atlas of ancient egypt by baines and malek all right so we can sit there and see that particular case Israel biblical in Assyria and Egypt. Now, this is another aspect. The left hand side shows what Egypt and the Sinai Peninsula. All right. And they got what they call the Gulf of Suez. Now, the Mediterranean Sea is north of Egypt and west of the land of Canaan, which later became Israel, which later became known as Palestine and so forth. Map of the Assyrian Empire, the 9th to 7th century BCE. All right, so we want this to be shown. The green part that you see in there where it says the Egyptian kingdom, Assyria ruled over that from the aspect when Ashur Banipal, the son of Isarhaddon, conquered it in 671 BCE. All right, another aspect is that Israel was conquered from 721 or 722 BCE to 701 BCE, Judah that is being taken captive from Lachish by Sennacherib. What's the point? How can the scriptures be a plagiarism when the Assyrian record of Egyptian stuff that some people say, oh, the Bible's plagiarized from Egypt. How can that be the case when the history that's being shown in it shows that the Israelites was taken by the Assyrians in the 8th century BCE and history shows you that the Assyrians took over Egypt in the 7th century BCE. But the Bible and the Assyrian records both speak about them conquering the Israelites. So we already went over that in that particular aspect all right let's go on if we will to the next slide next slide brother we want to show in this particular case what we're talking about this is called elephantine matter all right elephantine marriage contract of 409 bc or bce jewish aramaic persian era how papyrus legal scrolls were made and it shows you how it was made and then it shows you the contract in that particular case. Malek, in his book, Atlas of Ancient Egypt, speaks of the Jews of Elephantine Island, as does the Bible. We already read in Jeremiah 44 earlier, right, about the Israelites that was in the land of Egypt. So it's not too hard to figure what we're talking about in that particular case. When you read about Patros, that is Southern Egypt, referred to in Egyptian writings as Pteret, all right? But referred to in a biblical aspect as patros. So we just want this, or patros, pardon me. We just want that to be noted for edification purposes. The Israelites migrated to African places in history, however, since the day of Solomon. All right. 
let's go on to the next slide, please. Now, this right here called the Bagoas matter. It says this, the Jewish temple, according to Bagoas, later existed when Cambyses took over Egypt in 525 BCE. Some argued that the Jews of Elephantine Island were in Egypt since the era of the 7th century BCE. That is to say, 600 something BCE, which will correlate to the time of Josiah, king of Judah. If that is the case, then it stands to reason that they were there since the era of the Assyrian rule over what is commonly referred to now as the Middle East. All right. The terminology Middle East was coined in the year 1902 by a guy named Mahan, M-A-H-A-N. All right. So we can gain an understanding of what that's talking about. Next slide, the inner matter. According to Trigger, which is the name of the author in his book called Ancient Egypt, we see this. If, as is highly likely, the Jews had been in the habit of sacrificing lambs in their temple, they would have given grave offense to the religious susceptibilities of the priests of KHN. U.M., a false god, who was believed to be the incarnate, incarnated in a ram. What is being stated is this. The Israelites sacrificed lambs. A lamb is a child of a sheep and a ram. All right. One of the gods of the ancient Egyptians was incarn in, pardon me, incarnated into a ram. So the Israelites sacrificed a lamb is giving grave offense. So now when you already read that the temple was destroyed in Elephantine Island by the ancient Egyptians, when you read on your own time concerning the Elephantine papyrus matter um, and so forth, the reason why the Egyptians may want to destroy it is because they were sacrificing a child of the God of the ancient Egyptian culture. Okay. So we just want that to be noted for reference purposes. Next slide, my brother. Thank you. This is to show external references of what we're talking about in this particular case. The San Balat matter, Nehemiah, chapter 2, verse 10. All right, so we can gain an understanding of what we're talking about and what we're dealing with in this particular regard. All right? And it says the following. And when San Balat, the Haronite, and Tobiah, the servant, the Ammonite, heard of it it grieved them exceedingly for there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of israel let's go to nehemiah chapter 4 verse 1 but it came to pass that when sanballat and tobiah and the arabians and the ammonites and the astrodites heard that the repairing of the walls of jerusalem went forward and that the breaches began to be stopped then they were very wolf and they conspired Fired all of them together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion therein. So the Arabians in history were not also the friends of the house of Israel. The point of mention in this is because it speaks of Sanballat. Those in other verses in Nehemiah speak of Sanballat, who was an adversary to Nehemiah. The Elephantine papyrus speaks of a Sanballat who ruled during the era of Artaxerxes Langemanus in the fifth century. BCE. All right. So we just want this to be pointed out for reference purposes. Next slide, brother. Thank you. We want to get into this right, right here. Gamaria, the era of the prophet Jeremiah. All right. Says this. Gamaria. This is also referred to as a bula. When you look at the top part, reading from the right to the left, you see Gamal. Mem Resh Yod Hey Wow. Gamar Yahoo. Gamar means what? To finish or complete. Gamar Yah, the Most High has completed. Gamaria is written in Jeremiah chapter 43 and in chapter 44. So this is another thing of Hebrew writing written before the era of the time of Herod. All right. So we're going to continue on in this particular aspect. Okay. The diaspora, next slide, brother, thank you, says this. The dispersion of the Jews after the matter with Assyria began with the sack of Jerusalem in the 6th century BC. 
carrying a captive beyond the Euphrates. First Kings chapter 14, verse 15 speaks of a prophecy about Israel or is a prophecy of Israel being carried away beyond the river, the river Euphrates. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 64. The most High will scatter you from one end of the earth even to the other. All right. Some of the people decided to stay in Babylon. And when Rome came to power in time, they became known as the Jews of Parthia. Parthia was a rival to the Romans. Yes, Yisrael was scattered. Parthia was also the people of Persia that actually were hired to be against the Romans. Diaspora part two. Next slide, please. It should be pointed out that there were Israelites of the northern kingdom living in Judah. Let's go, and we're going to read this one. First Kings chapter 12, verse 17. So we can gain an understanding of what we're talking about. First Kings chapter 12, verse 17. All right, and it says the following, so we can gain an understanding of what we're talking about and what we're dealing with. And it says the following. All right, thank you, my brother. And it says this. But as for the children of Israel that dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. So there were Israelites of the northern tribes that lived in the southern kingdom of Judah. We spoke on the Elephantine matter. However, there were those of the Israelites sent to Egypt under Ptolemy the first. These were, pardon me, these are the ones who descended later were commissioned to make what became known as the Septuagint. What am I saying? According to the book of the historian Josephus, right, it says that Ptolemy the first took Israelites from the land of Israel and shipped them to the literal land of Egypt. That was during the era of Ptolemy the first. Ptolemy the second, Philadelphia, is the one who commissioned their later descendants that were sent over from the land of Israel as captives to go back to the land of Israel, get their records, and make what later on became known as the Septuagint. Let's go on. Israelites were sent to Libya by Ptolemy the first also. The people in Cyrene, which is in Libya, which is next to Egypt in Northeast Africa, were under Greek rule until Rome took it over in 96 BCE. That's how we teach in Shema Yisrael. You can check the references. The people that Trajan, then later Hadrian fought, were the descendants of those whom Ptolemy the first brought to North Africa. Trajan and later on Hadrian were Roman emperors. All right. So we want that to be noted for edification purposes. I'm going to ask the brother Josiah Ben Levy, Natan L, to go into the book of Zechariah, chapter 7, and read with a strong, profound voice Zechariah, chapter 7, verse 13, so we can gain an understanding of what we're talking about and what we're dealing with. All right. Zechariah. Chapter 7, verse 13, says the following. Getting to the page. Thank you, my brother. And it says this. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Zechariah, chapter 7, starting in verse 12. Okay. Right there at the bottom, bro. Thanks. King. Yay. They made their hearts as an ad adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord, which the words which Jehovah has of hosts has sent them by spirit, by the hand of the former prophets. Therefore came three great wrath from Jehovah of hosts. Read on to verse 13 so we can show the diaspora. It just goes to show the reason when the Most High sent the prophets, they didn't listen, they didn't want to keep the law. Now here's the other side due to not keeping the commandments of the Most High. Read on. And it came to pass that as he called, and, and they would not hear. As the Most High called and they would not hear. They didn't want to hear Yah. Read on. So they should call and I would not hear, said Jehovah of hosts. All right, so when you see the diaspora and the people bowing down to their idols and so forth and so on, let's understand what's happening. Read on. But I will scatter them with a whirlwind among all the nations whom they have not known. 
So diaspora being dispersed, being scattered among all the nations whom they have not known. Read on. Thus the land was desolate after them. The land of Yisrael that they inhabited during the time from the time of Joshua all the way down to the time when Persia came up to rule. They laid the pleasant land desolate as the brother's going to read. All right, read on. The, thus the land was desolate after them so that no man passed through nor returned. Meaning no man of the house of Israel, the true inhabitants of that land, passed through nor returned. Read on. For they laid the pleasant land desolate. Hallelujah. So they laid the pleasant land desolate. They rejected the land that was given to their ancestors. Ben Ami, in his book entitled God, the Black Man in Truth, says this. He points out that when Assyria fell, there were Israelites who migrated to what is now continental Africa and set up kingdoms. One being known as Zeg Zeg. All right. So we just want this to be noted for edification purposes. Next slide, brother. Thank you. Micah chapter 5, verse 6 says this And the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many peoples, as dew from Yah, as showers upon the grass that are not looked for from man nor awaited at the hands of the sons of men. And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the nations. In the midst of many peoples, as a lion among the beasts of the forest, as a young lion among the flocks of sheep, who, if he go through and treadeth down, and teareth in pieces, and there is none to deliver. So it says that the children of Israel, what will be a remnant among the nations? In the midst of many peoples. Let's understand what Micah talking about. Micah prophesied around and before the time of the prophet Isaiah. So the dispersion diaspora was known already. So we can gain some understanding. Some of the people scattered in Africa that lay claim to be in Israel. All right. The God people that live in Ghana. Sefri people that live in Ghana. The Igbo people that live in Nigeria. Ibibio people that live in Nigeria. Ewe people that live in Nigeria. Nigeria. Ashanti people. That live in Ghana. Now, that's just some of the peoples that actually, brothers and sisters, lay claim to be in the house of Israel in continental Africa. Okay? Let's go on, if we will, to the next slide. Next slide. Thank you, brother. Dr. Ben speaks on the Israelites. Now, he may have not been the best fan of Israelites, but let's just see some of the stuff that he cited. There were many Hebrew, parentheses Jewish, tribes that are of indigenous so-called Negroes origin. These African Jews caught in a rebellion and Cyrene against Roman imperialism and marked the beginning of a vast Jewish migration or cause a mount a, pardon me, it marked the beginning of a mass Jewish migration Southwood in Sudan, West Africa. Black Israelite immigrants from Northern and Eastern Africa merged with indigenous groups in Western Africa to become the Fulani, Bornu, Kanem of Lake Chad. Also forming a parent stock of the Ashanti, the Hausa, Bene Ephraim and Bavumbu. You can read his book on that called African Origins of Major Western Religions, written in 1970. So we just want that to be noted for edification purposes. All right. So we're going to get into this particular part and that aspect right here, if we will. Okay. Dr. Clark in the matter of the Israelites. Now, I just want to sit there and have this to be cited in video format. Let's listen.
Pay attention. Where did the Western Asian people go? He's asking. Let's go on, brothers and sisters, all right? All right, that is an excerpt from Dr. Clark, all right? And in it, he says in part, I wanted to get to the exact minute, he says, after the matter that happened in 70 AD, where did the Western Asiatic people go? He said that he saw no migration pattern that led them over into Europe, but he saw a migration pattern that led them over into, as he sat there and stated, in the West Africa, because many people that are in the land of Ghana were of the Hebrew faith. Now, one of the things is that we wanted to point out, we should note this. There are those of the Hebrew faith that went to Western Africa. For the faith of the Hebrews to be in West Africa, the Hebrews had to be there at one time or another. How would you know or be able to identify what is the faith of the Hebrews unless the Hebrews were there at one particular time in history? So we just want that to be noted for edification purposes. So there was a teaching by some brothers saying basically the Jews, to use the term loosely, that they were never in Western Africa. But yet you got one of the scholars right here that said they did go to Western Africa. And then if that ain't enough, you had prior to this particular thing shown, you had the aspect with Dr. Ben, another one of their scholars, speaking about the Hebrews or the Israelites said by some as Jews that went over to Western Africa. And if that ain't enough, you got the scriptures that gets into the aspect of saying that the people being scattered over, all right? So we just want that to be noted for edification purposes, all right? Let's go into the next slide, please. Some of the oldest Jews, if you will, the Falashes is said to be obscure, Yet they themselves state that they went to Ethiopia from the era of Solomon, king of Israel. So we just want this to be noted. What you're looking at right there is one of their homes or their huts, if you will, and what you call Gondar province in Ethiopia. They themselves call themselves Beta Yisrael. All right. We speak about them periodically. Now. We just want this to be noted for reference purposes and what we're talking about. The matter of Hebrew explained. All right? So let's understand this. The matter of Hebrew explained. Just after the turn of the 19th century, an English essayist named William Gifford reported that Americans during the revolution planned to substitute Hebrew as the official language of the United States. Hebrew was believed by the colonists to be the mother of all tongues. And until 1817, the annual commencement addresses at Harvard were delivered in Hebrew, referred to Washington Post Parade Magazine, 1982. All right, so we just want that to be noted for edification purposes. Next slide, brother. All right says this hebrew slash habiru hebrew a member of the semitic peoples living in palestine a semitic language of the afro asiatic family the language of the ancient hebrews afro asiatic in definition of or relating to afro asiatic hamito semitic languages a family of languages including as subfamily Semitic, Egyptian, Berber, Cushitic. Cush we know apparently is Ethiopia. 
So we just want that to be noted for reference purposes. The numerous references to the activity of the Habiru as a disruptive social element in Canaan comprise a facet of the Amarna letters. We went over them earlier. The same, pardon me, the name varies in form from Sagaz to Habiru, Habiru, Hapiru, Apiru, Abiru. There can be little doubt that the name Hebrew derives from the term. So we just want that to be noted for edification purposes. Next slide, please. What you're looking at right here, all right, is Indo-European languages. When you look at it, it says Hittite, Indo-Iranian, Greek, Italic, Armenian, Germanic, Albanian, Slavic, Celtic, Baltic, as well as a thing called Tocharian. So I want this to be noted for edification purposes. All right. One of the things we want to point out is that Hebrew is not part of the Indo-European languages. OK, now let's look at this Afro-Asiatic languages, Afro-Asiatic breaks down Ethiopia, breaks down Egyptian, breaks down Near East, breaks down New Africa, breaks down Semitic, breaks down Akkadian, breaks down Aramaic and Hebrew, breaks down Gies, Tigray, Amharic, Harari, and so forth. Looking at the left-hand side of the picture, Hebrew is listed as part of the Afro-Asiatic languages, which belong to people that would be understood from Western Asia or Northeast Africa, if you will. All right? So we can gain an understanding of what we're talking about. Let's go on. 201 Hebrew verbs. All right? The Hebrew verb differs from English and other Indo-European verbs in several respects. One of the reasons for that is because it's not a Indo-European language. Hebrew began to be replaced with Greek during the era of the Maccabees. However, we want to point out that Hebrew did not die out as a language. All right. It's just that Greek at one point became the lingua franca of a particular area. Let's get into this particular aspect here. Sinai slash Siloam inscription. What you're looking at on the right hand side is the Siloam inscription that goes all the way between the era of Solomon the king and Isaiah the prophet. All right. So we can gain an understanding of what we're talking about in this particular aspect. What you're looking at on the left hand side is images that were drawn of the menorah, images that were drawn of ancient synodic writing. All right. So we just want that to be shown for reference purposes. All right. So we just want this to be shown in this particular case. Hebrew alphabet. The Hebrew alphabet. The Hebrew alphabet has 22 letters. The Hebrew language, as any other languages, has vowels. Vowels make sound. There are those who are illiterate of a language, yet are able to speak that same language. Josephus points out that Hebrew sound is similar to Aramaic in speech. What became known as Hebrew is what the Israelites spoke, however. The alphabet in writing is what was first derived from Sinaitic and then later on Aramaic. So I writing style, like script form, the block form, if you will, the letters that you're using. That's what I want to speak on in that point. What we're looking at is this. This is Hebrew presentation. You got Aleph, Bet, Gamel, Dalit, He, Wow, Zion, Chet, Tet, Yo, Kaf, Kaf, Sophie, Lamed, Mem, Nun, Nun, Sophie, Samek, Ayin, Pei, Fe, Sophie, Zade, Zade, Sophie, Kufre, Shintao. These letters here, that you see are actually Aramaic form of writing as we went over before. Because the children of Israel used it, it became, since they were part of the Hebrew people, it became by default known as the Hebrew language. You understand? But the language that the Israelites spoke was properly called the Israelite language, or they spoke Israelite, if you understand that particular case. Hebrew having more of a dominance in 
understanding as far as what word it should be called became such. So this is what we want to point out in that particular regard. Then what we're looking at here is old Hebrew alphabet. All right. Looking at it from the left hand side. Alep bet gemel dalit. Hey, wow. Zain het yod ket tet. Pardon me. Yod kap lamet mem nun samek. Ayin pe zade kop resh sintau. There's no V in old Hebrew. All right. There's no F in old Hebrew. All right. So we just want that to be noted for edification purposes. All right. The Phoenician aspect. Next slide, brother. Thank you. What we're looking at in this particular case is this, right? Aleph ox, bet house, gamel camel, dalit door, hay window, wow hook, vain weapon, Het wall, some say fence. Tet good, some say snake. Yod hand. Kaf palm, some say also spoon. Lamed gold, some say also teach. Mem water. Noon serpent, some say means fish. Samek fish, some say actually means support. Ayin I pay mouth. Sade papyrus, some people say means fish hook. Quote, eye of the needle. Some actually say it means monkey or the back of one's head. Resh, head, some say also means leader. Sheen, tooth. Tau, mark. The aspect here is still ancient writing, but the Phoenician style of it. Just like you got graffiti English and calligraphy English and script English and lowercase English. So did other ancient languages have different styles of writing in the same particular language. All right. What we're looking at right here is called the debone matter that you read about King Misha of Moab in the style of writing in which he did. Next slide. So you get to see what that's talking about. Next slide, please. What we're looking at here is called the Samaritan matter, all right? And as we see the Aleph, Bet, Gamel, and so forth, and it just goes to show that the same language was written by different people at different levels of time and place and location, all right? So we want that to be noted. Next slide, please. The aspect of vowels. You have the kwam, kamat goes under the letter. Patak goes under the letter. Zere goes under the letter. Sego goes under the letter. Shawa goes under the letter 90% of the time. Kolam goes next to the letter. Kirik goes under the letter. Kwebuts goes under the letter. Shuruk goes next to the letter. Khataf kwamat. Khataf patak. Kataf Sego. Those last three vowels on the bottom side of it all go underneath the letter. Now, when you're listening carefully, looking at the top line, when I actually said what? That Shawa goes under the letter 90% of the time is because when you're dealing sometimes in Hebrew with what is referred to as Kaso feet, as in the word Melech, that goes inside the letter. So shawa only goes under the letter 90% of the time. When you ask a female, ma, meaning what? Shalomek, shalomek, that kaf, ka sound, k sound at the end has the shawa inside of the kaf. That's why I said that the shawa goes under the letter only 90% of the time. So we just want that to be noted for edification purposes. All right? Let's go on to the next slide, if we will. Rules in Hebrew. Next slide, brother. Thank you. Hebrew is read from right to left. The letters also hold numerical values. This will be discussed in a part two of this particular case. The letters which are silent remain silent, unlike English, because in English, comb has a silent B. All right. So 
the understanding too that Hebrew is the language agenda is actually true. All right, next slide, please, so we can gain an understanding of what we're talking about. Thank you. The letter He and Tau. Okay, these two letters here are feminine letters. You know what a feminine letter is by seeing it as He or Tau. Now, you know what a feminine word is when He is the last letter and right before it is any letter of the Hebrew alphabet that has a kwamats with it. All right, so in the word kipa, you know that's feminine because the pay has a kwamats and then the next letter is a hey. Tau too is a feminine letter. Those two, one being the fifth letter, the letter hey, and tau being the 22nd letter. All right, so we can gain an understanding of what we're talking about. Next slide, please. Thank you, brother. Okay. Rules and regulations, because everything has rules and regulations, including languages. It says this. In Hebrew, there is a set of verbs. A verb is an action word. There are seven verb stems. There are seven stems to this system, sorry. Referred to as the qual, the nif'al, the piel, the pu'al, the hif'il, the hofal, and the hitpa'el. The call stem is referred to as the easy stem. That's the simple active. The nif'al stem is referred to as the simple passive. The pl stem is referred to as the intensive active. The pu'al stem is referred to as the intensive passive. The hif'il stem is referred to as the causative. The hof'al stem is referred to as the passive of the hif il and the hit pa'el is referred to as the reflexive so in the hebrew seven stem system you have three active three passive and one reflexive all right so let that be noted for edification purposes katab active to write nif al nik tab to be written Ani kotab, I am writing. That is the qual stem. Ani katabti, I wrote. That is the actual active. Ze niktab, this is written. That is the nifal stem. One is active, one is passive. In Hebrew, a noun is known as either feminine or masculine. The possession of a noun is noted by the end of the noun. Example, koma meaning wall. Koma t meaning my wall. All right? So we want that to be noted. Next slide, please. The matter of verbs, past and future. So we can gain an understanding of what we're talking about. All right? In regards to verbs, the past tense is noted as showing the suffix at the end of the word. Example, shama means to hear. Shamati means I heard. In regards to verbs, the future tense is noted as showing the prefix in the beginning of the word. Example, shama means to hear. Tishma means you will hear. Next slide, brother. So we can show what we're talking about. Thank you. Shamata wa tishma. You heard and you will hear. The part you're looking at there on the left-hand side has the letter sheen, mem, iron, and tau. Tau there at the end is the um, suffix. Here we see the word shamata. The word means you heard. This is noted in the past tense. What we're looking at on the right-hand side is the word tishma which means you will hear the sheen mem iron, sheen mem iron, looking carefully, does not drop. The distinction is in a future tense, you show it as a prefix. So it can be noted for edification purposes. All right, the Hebrew and Yiddish matter. Next slide, brother. So that way we can um, explain what we're talking about in this particular case, because some people are saying that the Hebrew we teach here in Shema Yisrael among so-called Old Testament based 
so-called non-messianic that um that we're speaking Yiddish and that modern Hebrew is Yiddish, but such is not the case. And we're going to explain what that's about. The Hebrew and Yiddish matter. The Hebrew word you see there on the left-hand side is what? Hachama, which means son. All right, S-U-N. Aim, Hebrew word for mother. You see that in Ezekiel chapter 16, in Ezekiel like 23. All right, now let's look at the part there in the blue. Dizun, Yiddish word for son, S-U-N. And the Yiddish word for mother is mut ar. So the Hebrew word for mother is aim. The Hebrew word for son is chama. The Yiddish word for son is dizun. The Yiddish word for mother is mut er. So you can see there's a difference in Yiddish and Hebrew. All right? All you got to do is you can even just study a language to find out what this is about. All right? Notes about Hebrew. Next slide, brother. Thank you. We see this. Most Hebrew we know come from the scriptures. Most Hebrew in the scriptures is that of the kingdom of Judah. Many in Judah who spoke what they spoke was influenced by the northern kingdom. The Hebrew language predates the matter of Kena'an. Thus, Mahalalil, Mahalel. Ending in El is not a Canaanite deity, but rather a word meaning power. The older Israelites spoke multiple languages, such as Akkadian, Chaldean, and Aramaic. Why do we emphasize on Aramaic? Is because one of the 12 tribes of Israel, Simeon, said, as Shem owned from the root word Shema, Shema means what? To hear, but it's an Aramaic word. All right? The Hebrew root word meaning to hear is the word He'ezin. All right? When you get the word Ozen from, which means ear, or Aznayim, which means ears. So we want that to be noted for edification purposes. Next slide, brother. This is how we teach in Shema Yisrael. Next slide. Thank you. Now, this is called Notes About Hebrew. Tell the ear inscription. This is about Balaam, the son of Beor, a witch, like a sorcerer, that was hired to curse Yisrael. He eventually told Balak, Israel has to curse themselves by not keeping Torah. Hint, get the point, all right? So if I can't express nothing outside of all of the history and all of the so forth and so on, we want to let it be noted for edification purposes, brothers and sisters, that um, keeping the commandments means more than anything out of anything. All the Hebrew, all the archaeology, all the cross references cannot compare to an obedient servant of the Most High. However, not taking anything from obedience, being more important than sacrifice. Sacrificing your time to do whatever, sacrificing things that you may want. Obedience is better than all of that, and it doesn't take much. It took me more time to put this PowerPoint together than it does for me to be candid to as a child to stop stealing when I was a little thief as a little boy. All you got to do is just want to do right. If I cannot express anything more important is to keep the commandments of the Most High. Balak knew that. That's why he told Balaam, listen, I'm sending them daughters of Moab so Israel can fall. All right? So we just want that to be noted. Next slide, please, brother. Thank you. When I refer to this entitled, I personally called it Israelite Scribble Scrabble. All right? One thing to point out is that many do to ain't Many, due to ancient Israel worship and false gods, have found where Israelites in the ancient world inscribed yod heh wah -He with a goddess or so. All right? Ezekiel chapter 6, verse 6 is where the Mosai said that um, due to Israel's wickedness, a lot of things of ancient Israel will be smashed and will be destroyed. One of the reasons why you don't find a lot of archaeology in, of ancient Israel. All right? So we want to point that particular thing out. So the concept saying that the Asherah is a wife of Yahweh or so forth and so on, that is only noted because unfortunately Israel disobeyed the laws of the Most High and coupled someone else with the Most High. All right? But the Most High's wife is Israel when you go to Isaiah 54, not Asherah. All right? We're going to go on to the next slide. Thank you, bro. This is referred to as Isaiah and the Yavne writing. 
What you're seeing there on the left-hand side is the Isaiah scroll from the Dead Sea Scrolls. And what you're looking at on the other side is the Yabne writing that dates to the era of the Maccabees. Ancient Israel did not speak English. All right, so we just want to point that out for reference purposes. Next slide, please. Darius the first slash Babylon. Darius the first was the king of Persia. And as you see here in a book you can get online called the Babylonians written by Gwendolyn Leak or Leak. Um, you see how the Babylonian himself is even pictured, man of color. And as you see in the walls of Susa Palace, called Shushan in the book of Esther and so forth, people of color. The Israelites were and all were around such. Just want that to be noted. Daniel chapter 5, verse Daniel chapter 10, sorry, verse 5. So we can gain an understanding. Next slide, please. I lifted up my eyes and looked and behold a man clothed in linen whose loins were girded with the fine gold of Ufaz. His body also was like the barrel and his face as the appearance of lightning and his eyes were as torches of fire and his arms and his feet like to the color of burnished brass and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. What are we dealing with? Was it Mikael the angel? Was it Gabriel the angel? Who knows? Point is this, brothers and sisters. One of the things to point out, brothers and sisters, is this. It says that his arms like to the color of burnished brass. So we just want that to be noted. Brass, like the color of a penny, you might say. Okay, next slide, thank you. Hebrews in Egypt, painted in 1867 by a guy named Edward Pointner. Edward Pointner is the guy that you see on the right-hand side. The Hebrews that he painted in Egypt are the people that you see on the left-hand side. And as we can be able to sit there and see, we kind of see what they're looking like, even according to Mr. Pointner. All right, so just want to point that out. Next slide, please. Thank you. Rogers versus Williams. All right. It says this. J. Rogers stated in his book, 100 Amazing Facts About the Negro, that the characters of the Bible are largely Negroes. He lived from 1880, some people say 1883 he was born, to the year 1966. He was of Jamaican parents. Rogers stated that. Now, Chancellor Williams stated in his book, Destruction of Black Civilization, this. That the ancient Hebrews were white. And he lived from 1893 until 1992. So we just want that to be noted for edification purposes. Chancellor Williams, in his book entitled Destruction of Black Civilization, stated that the Hebrews and or the terminology used by some as Jews in the ancient world were white. So we got to ask who paid who to sit there and teach such a thing. Because scholars, besides him, said the opposite. And pictures were shown as well. So we just want this to be noted for edification purposes. All right? Next slide, brother. Thanks. Biblical Archaeology and Focus, which is a book written by a guy named Shovel, and Jeremiah the prophet, the children of Dan in a horned altar, the children of Judah in a horned altar, Jeremiah 17, verse 1 through 4. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron and with the point of a diamond. It is graven upon the tablet of their heart and upon the horns of your altars. And thou, even of thyself, shall discontinue from thy heritage that I gave thee, and I will cause thee to serve thine enemies in the land which thou knowest not. For ye have kindled a fire in my nostril which shall burn forever. So we just want this to be pointed out for reference purposes, all right, and what it says. Next slide, thank you. 
This one is entitled what? Biblical archaeology. Says this. Next slide. In an inscription of Shalmaneser III, Ahab of Israel is identified as one of the leaders of the opposition, where he said the following. He brought along to help him 10,000 soldiers of Ahab, the Israelite. Ahabu Sirilah. All right. So we just want that to be noted from that particular case. All right. The fact that other nations mention Israel means a lot for those who are into the debate aspect or just want clarity. All right. What are they talking about? It seems to be the interest of some to try to deny that people of Israel existed. Such, however, is shown to be inaccurate. Next, we will go into the fact of what happened to the Israelites when they left the land of Israel from the era of the 9th century BC until the time of their great enslavement. Because remember, this is called what? From Averis to Alabama. So we can gain an understanding of what we're talking about. Next slide, brother. Thank you. The Bible is history, written by a guy named Ian Wilson, states this. There is also evidence that many of those time-honored allies, the Canaanite slash Phoenician inhabitant of Tyre, were forced around the same time to quit their city. They moved all the way across the Mediterranean to found Carthage in what is now Tunisia. All right? Now, next slide, please, so we can gain an understanding of what we're talking about with the Carthage matter. Okay, thank you for that. This one is entitled Hebrewisms of West Africa. A book written by Joseph Williams says this. Sir Harry, jo Sir Harry Johnston is of the opinion that the Phoenicians were a Semitic tribe closely allied to the Hebrew stock. Again, inscriptions indicate that certain tribes of Asher and Zebulun lived in Carthage ever since the founding of the city. In Africa, the first Jewish graveyards to be noted are those of Carthage, in which Jewish catacombs are recognized. Of all the Jewish colonies in Africa, the most flourishing was probably that of Carthage. All right? So we can gain an understanding of what we're talking about in this particular case, that there was Israelites from Asher and Zebulun, part of the northern kingdom, if you will, that was in Carthage, which was in Tunisia. We already went over the fact of Israel in Liberia. Libya. We went over the fact of Israelites in Egypt. All right? So we just want this to be shown for edification purposes. Next slide, please. Thank you. What you're looking at here is called the tribes and Phoenician. All right? On the left-hand side, you will see Manasseh, Zebulun, Issachar, Dan, and Asher, and Ephraim. On the left-hand side, by where the water is, you see the words where it says Phoenicia. So, yes, the Phoenicians, which later went into Carthage in northeast Africa, into north central Africa, that is, in Tunisia, and set up Carthage, were, yes, some were Canaanites and some were Israelites. So this is what we want to talk about. According to the book by Ian Wilson that we mentioned, it speaks about the Canaanites. When you read about the book or them in the book about Carthage and Hebrewism of West Africa, it speaks about them as Israelites. So when you're doing cause references, you can then note and see that the Phoenicians that inhabited, that became known as the Carthaginians, were actually people of both Canaan and Israel. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you, brother. All right, so we can gain an understanding of what we're talking about. Carthage map had a little difficulty with the button, but we're going to move on. All right, giving honor and praise to Yah, creator, maker of heaven and earth. What you're looking at here is called the Carthage map. Carthage. The Carthaginians were Semites, 
akin in blood and features to the ancient Jews. Their language now and then struck a Hebraic note, as when they called their chief magistrates shofet, which means judges. All right? Sometimes said as shopet when you understand that there's no ancient F pronunciation, but that's another subject for a Hebrew class. But well, we just want this to be noted for edification purposes. All right? Carthage. This is coming from a book that we just cited right here. What I just cited comes from a book entitled Caesar in Christ by Will Durant. All right, next slide. Thank you, my brother. This one we calling here the Traitors of Solomon. So we can gain an understanding of what we're talking about. There were a nation of seamen and traders, and they had to import the food. For this food, they paid either with the produce of their own artists and handcraftsmen, with timber, or work in bronze and iron, or with rich purple dyes, or with merchandise. They traveled very far. They made great discoveries. They went as far south as Cape of Good Hope, certainly as far as Sierra Leone, and as north as Britain. So these are things we just wanted to talk about in this particular aspect that the traders of Solomon did go to as far as Britain, they go to as far as Sierra Leone, and so forth and so on. Sierra Leone is in Western Africa. Britain is in Europe. All right? So the Solomon traders did do what they did in that particular regard. All right? Next slide, please. Thank you. This one we're calling Ezekiel 27. All right? And it says this. The inhabitants of Zidon and Arvad were thy mariners, the ancients of Gebal, they of Persia and Lud and of Put were in thy army. Judah and the land of Israel were thy merchants. Dan also in Javan going to and fro occupied by thy fears. Bright iron, Cassia, and Calamus were in thy market. Dedan was thy merchant and precious stones for chariots, precious clothes for chariots. So we just want that to be noted for edification purposes. What is this saying right here? Judah and the land of Israel. Now, Ezekiel 27 speaks about the people of Tyre, all right, or the people of the Tyrians, which by where the port was, where the ancient people of Carthage came from. Judah and the land of Israel were thy merchants. So yes, according to that, they did do that particular aspect. Let's go on, if we will, to the next slide. The matter of the purple and the Tyrians with the Israelites. All right, next slide, brother. Thank you. And it says this, Ezekiel chapter 27, verse 7, a fine linen with richly woven work from Egypt was thy sale. And it says that it might be to thee for an ensign, blue and purple, from the Isles of Elisha was thy awning. Ezekiel chapter 27, verse 16. Aram was thy merchant by reason of the multitude of thy wealth. They traded for thy wares with carbuncles, purple, and richly woven work, and fine linen, and coral and rubies. So, now, what is the point in that particular case? Is because the terminology Phoenician is a Greek term in purple. That's why you would read in the aspect of purple in Ezekiel 27 when it speaks about Judah and the tribe of Dan being the merchants with the people of, Ty of Tyre, which later on went to Carthage and set up the Carthaginian kingdom. All right. Carthage, according to Durant, says this. Her settlement was called Kart Hadast, New Town. The Greeks transformed the name into Car Sedon, the Romans into Carthago. The Latins gave the name Africa to the region around Carthage and Utica and followed the Greeks in calling its Semitic population Poenai, that is to say, example, Phoenicians. The sieges of Tyre by Shamanesar of Assyria, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, and Alex, I mean, Alexander of Greece brought many wealthy Tyrians into Africa. And by Africa, we're speaking in particular in this regard to Carthage. Okay, so we want this to be noted for evidence purposes and what we're talking about. All right, Zephaniah, era of Josiah of Judah. Next slide, brother. 
Thank you. It says this. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my suppliance, even the daughter of my dispersed, shall bring my offering. Let's jump down to verse 14. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Yisrael. Be glad and rejoice with all thy heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. So beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, it speaks about Israelites being beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. Zephaniah was an Israelite prophet speaking to Israelites about Israelite matters. So we want this to be noted. This is Zephaniah chapter 3 we just read, by the way. So it says, from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. Next slide, please. Thank you, my brother. And it says the following. Blue and white now rivers. So the rivers of Ethiopia, all right? Lake Tana in Ethiopia becomes the blue now. Lake Victoria in what we call by the area of Kenya becomes the white now. So let's know and understand this, that in ancient times, both what's referred to currently as Ethiopia and what is referred to currently as Kenya was both called Kush. So when it says beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, biblical terminology being Kush from beyond the rivers of Kush is talking about today's terminology called the blue and the white now from beyond those rivers, the Bible in Zephaniah 3 is saying the Israelites in part were scattered. So this is this type of stuff that we want to bring out for edification purposes. All right. Next slide, please. We're going to um, get into this particular matter. Thank you, my brother. This one we're calling diaspora of the Hebrews. The picture that you're looking at, brothers and sisters, comes from a book called Hebrewisms of West Africa, where it shows one aspect of them fleeing from the capital, Jerusalem, going into Egypt, going into Sudan, then going west. All right. Now we already read beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. We shown earlier where the map showed where the rivers of Ethiopia are. So it's not too far fetched that the Israelites were noted for going into Western Africa. Another point we want to make is that earlier we read, according to Dr. Ben, who wasn't the best friend of Israelites, that's why I cited him about Israelites going into Western Africa. We went over a video speaking with Dr. Clark aspect in which he said, where did the Western Asiatic go after the temple was destroyed in 70 AD? I see no migration pattern that took them over into Europe. I do see a migration pattern that took them into Western Africa because the people that were in Ghana, West Africa, were part of the Hebrew faith people. That's from the video that we cited earlier. See the sources that we're citing? So nobody can actually say, you know what, actually, brother, you know the scriptures is the least cited source in this presentation? Give me, we gonna, um, I'm going to ask my brother here to read. Give me Psalms 85, verse 11. All right? Thank you for the time, brothers and sisters. Let's look at the picture and see if you notice anything. Like, you know, Ashanti and, you know, Ashanti was taken to from Ghana to Jamaica, like, you know, Nanny, the leader of the Maroons was from the Ashanti, okay, follow where we going, from Rivera, Alabama, here we go, give me the book of Psalms, chapter 85, verse 11, and I'm going to ask my brother Josiah, the son of Chief Natanel of the tribe of Levi to read, all right, let's go on, and it says this, hallelujah, hallelujah, mercy and truth are met together, righteous and peace, have kissed each other. Truth springeth out of the earth. Truth springeth out of the earth. One more time, read that. Truth springeth out of the earth. So when we go over artifacts and references and things of that sort, these are the things that we're talking about, brothers and sisters. This is not something we made up to sound special as black folk who are sad. Do you understand? These are things that we're citing different sources, European sources, white men, for those who... You got to have a white source in order to be accepted. We're citing sources from them, sources from the scriptures, because there's some who say, well, if it ain't in the scriptures or, or we deal with it in the scriptures, we cite that too. Because it says what? Read that again one more time from verse 11. Read. Mercy and truth. Mercy and truth are met. Read. Are met together. Are met together. Because you don't get mercy in debating. You don't get truth out of debating. Debating leads to somebody no offense intended literally getting slapped 
as didn't happen in one debate. I'm not making this up. There was a debate. Somebody reached out and touched somebody upon his face. That's wickedness. You're not getting that out of this kind of presentation. So go over that again. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Righteousness and peace. The Most High lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace, said the book of Numbers. If it be the will of the Most High. The Most High lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. The Most High lift up his countenance upon thee and give you peace, not war. The Most High lift up his countenance upon thee and give you peace. Not a problem. The Most High lift his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Lo makara. Not battle. The Most High lift up his countenance upon thee and give you peace, not war. The people were not praying for war. The people, if war came, prayed to be the victorious ones in the war. In the time of peace, you prepare for war. But you don't always have to sit there and be the aggressor. We want that to be noted. So read on. Truth spring up out of the earth and righteousness and righteousness have looked down from heaven. It says what? Truth springeth out of the earth. We're citing things that get into this particular aspect. The truth is going to come from the earth. You ain't going to shut down the truth of the Most High for so long. Yah said he hid his face from the eyes of Jacob and put a blinders on the house of Israel. Deuteronomy 28, verse 28. I'm going to ask the brother, Josiah, son of Chief Natanel of the tribe of Levi. Read, brother, Deuteronomy 28, verse 28. So we can gain an understanding of what we're talking about. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jehovah will smite thee with madness and with blindness and with astonishment of heart. So it's the most high that smit the people with blindness. It wasn't the white man. He didn't have enough power. We want this to be noted. Our people went into sleep because the most high put us asleep. As the land, the true land of Israel regains its strength. Whereas the children of Yisrael, as Leviticus chapter 26 speaks on, while we are in the land of our enemies, we're supposed to return back to the Most High. Hebrew don't trump righteousness. Artifacts don't trump righteousness. It says mercy and truth meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss one another. And that truth cometh from the earth, the earth that the Most High made. Let's go on. Next slide, brother. Thank you. The book speaks Isaiah chapter 11. Next slide. Thank you. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Most High will set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, one, and from Egypt, two, and from Hapatros, three, and from Cush, four, and from Elam, five and from Shinar six and from Hamath seven and from the islands of the sea and he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth so let's understand what that's is talking about we had the brother Josiah Ben Levy read the aspect in Zephaniah all right. When it speaks, brothers and sisters, getting into Israel, being dispersed and laying a pleasant land desolate. Then we see right here that the Most High speaks about some of the places where Israel was scattered. Assyria. We know about that. We went over the Tiglath Pelasar matter. Egypt. We went over the Elephantine matter. And from Patros, which is southern Egypt, Sudan, if you will. All right. And from Cush, which is modern-day Ethiopia. The Israelites went to Ethiopia. So why are people denying that the so-called philosophers could be Israel? Okay. And from Elam, which is by um, Iran, the ancient Persian era empire. And from Shinar, which is by southern Iraq. And from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations. In other words, nations take heed to what's about to happen. And shall assemble 
the outcast of Israel, and gathered together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Israel and Judah was what? Outcast and dispersed. So let's understand what's going on. Assemble the outcasts, gather together the dispersed. Why do I keep on hopping on this verse 12 in Isaiah 11 is for a reason. All right. And it says this. What? Assemble the outcast of Israel. Gather together the dispersed of Judah. There's a teaching talking about Israel stayed in the land and Judah was the only one kicked out. No. It says, assemble, which is synonymous to gathering together, the outcast, meaning outcast from the land, and dispersed. Look at the words carefully in verse 12. Assemble the outcast of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Israel will be assembled and Judah will be gathered together after both were respectfully outcast and dispersed to the four corners of the earth. It is not saying that Israel is still in the land and that we over here must be Judah by default. Maybe most of us in here are Judah. Who wouldn't want to be Judah when you're talking about being Israel? But we got to stick with the scriptures. Let's go on. Next slide, please. All right, so we can gain some understanding of what we're talking about. Next slide. Thank you. Recall this one here, then. The book speaks, Ezekiel chapter 11. All right? Again, the word of the Messiah came to me saying, Son of man, thy brethren, even thy brethren, the men of thy kindred and all the house of Yisrael, holy. Are they unto whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, Get you far from Yah unto us is this land given in possession? In other words, you had the other nations that came into where Israel was at in Jerusalem and then sat there and said, Oh, the most I gave it to us, Israel, the true people, you get out. Therefore, thus, therefore say, thus saith the Lord God, although I, speaking of the most high himself, although I have cast them far off among the heathen. And although I have scattered them among the countries, yet I will be to them as a little sanctuary in the countries where they shall come. Therefore say, thus saith the Lord God, I will even gather you from the people and assemble you from all the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. What are we reading? The Most High said what? Two things to point out. Ezekiel 11 verse 16 kills the concept well we can't really do nothing in captivity because it says right there and although i have scattered them many the israelites among the countries yet will i be to them the most i saying he will be to the israelites as a little sanctuary in the countries where they shall come so you don't have an excuse to not keep shabbat in the land of captivity because we can still call upon yah as our little sanctuary in the countries where we have came to then we go to verse 17. Therefore say, thus saith the Lord God, I will even gather you from the people and assemble you out of the countries. Gather and assemble. That's why I went to this part here. Gather and assemble, okay? You out of the countries where you have been scattered. Let's go back to the previous slide real quick because I want to emphasize this on a purpose because there's a whole video teaching that Judah was brought over here and that only one of the 12 tribes was scattered. There is a people teaching that, but this is not biblically sound. So we're going to go back to Isaiah 11, verse 12 again. And he, the Most High, shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcast of Israel and gather together, all right, gather together the dispersed of Judah. What does it say? Assemble the outcast gather together. Let's remember those words, assemble and gather together. Now, let's go, if we will, brothers and sisters, to the next slide. And in verse 17, we see here, gather and assemble yet again. You see, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 12 has the words gather and assemble. 
Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 17, has the words gather and assemble. We have to, as it says there, let the book speak. Judah was not the only tribe that was taken into captivity. That is the teaching that has plagued some Israelites who, no disrespect intended, there were Israelites who did not like or respect the 12 tribe chart that is in circulation. We here at Shema Yisrael do not subscribe to the 12 tribe chart in circulation. But some people not dealing with the scriptures as we are doing, getting in their feelings, if you will, want to just bash a chart without using the scriptures to support their stance. So this is why we meticulously went over the fact of saying Isaiah 11 verse 12 and Ezekiel 11 verse 17. Read those two verses and still think and see if only Judah was the one that was kicked out, then something is wrong. Okay. Let's go on. Next slide, brother. Thank you. Respect to my teacher, Kohen Mikael. All right. Goes on to say this. In his book, Israelites and Jews, A Significant Difference, Kohen Mikael says the following. The historian Philo stated that one million Hebrews resided from Libya and Egypt. From the Catabathmos to the border of Ethiopia. Catabathmos is a part in um, Libya in Northeast Africa. All right. We just want to point that out. Next slide, please. Thank you, my brother. Respect to my teacher, Kohen Mikael, my Hebrew teacher, Adaha Shaba Yisrael, says in his book. In the same book, we see the Greek historian and geographer Strabo. 63 BCE to 24 AD, wrote concerning the Hebrews of Cyrene. Now these Hebrews already got into all cities, and it is not hard to find a place in the habitable earth that has not admitted this tribe of men and is not possessed by it. So we just want that to be noted. Next slide, please. Respect to my teacher, Kohen Mikael. In the same book we read, when the Greeks and Romans invaded the East, the Edomites migrated into Europe and assimilated with other cultures, carrying their acquired Israelite traits with them because they learned under a guy named John Hyrcanus, the son of Simon Maccabeus, about the ways of Israel. Next slide, please. Thank you, my brother. Will Durant, an author from his book entitled Caesar in Christ, says the following. By 70 AD, there were thousands of Jews in Seleucia, on the Tigris, and in other Parthian cities. They were numerous in Arabia and crossed thence into Ethiopia. They abounded in Syria and Phoenicia. In the West, there were Jewish communities in Carthage, Syracuse. Putili, Capua, Pompeii, and Rome. So you had Israelites in Europe, yes. But one of the things we want to point out is that it also mentions Carthage as we went over before. All right? There were numerous, they were numerous in Arabia and crossed thence into Ethiopia. Next slide, please, brother. We want to um, explain what we're talking about in this particular case, all right? Says, The Lord's Jews, a book that's written by a guy named Louis Rappaport, all right? And it says the following. Thank you, my brother. The Sembatian is a key element in the mystery surrounding the Falash's origins. Find the Sembatian and you will find the Lord's tribes of Israel, according to legend. The river has been placed in America, China, Syria, and many other countries. What are they saying? Is that throughout these different countries, there were Israelites that are scattered. We already read in the book of Micah that the Most High will have the children of Israel among many peoples. So we can gain an understanding of what we're talking about and what we're dealing with in this particular aspect. All right, let's go on. And yes, there are people in China that lay claim to be in the house of Israel that live in a place called Kafeng, China that only deal with the Old Testament. 
that sit there and say they are not Jews, but are part of the Northern Kingdom tribes that was sent over there. So there's a book called Jews in Old China, and you can kind of look into that and see what it's about in that regard. Then we've got those speaking about those in America. Now, that's what we're going to get into this here. All right, next slide, please, so we can sit there and show what we're talking about in this particular regard. All right? Thank you, my brother, for that. The Jerusalem Chronicle Matter. In 1994 to 1996, the Jerusalem Chronicle, based out of Mississippi, which was an Israelite newspaper, addressed the matter of the Beta Yisrael in Ethiopia and stated that many of the elders are regretting going to Israel, the land, under the European Jews due to the colorism that is displayed there. Says one people or one person in that article, Jerusalem Chronicle, article from 1996 which is dated now 21 years ago from this date for 10 years they have told us that our immigration was successful it was a lie says adisa musala one of the ethiop one from the ethiopian hebrew community all right so he's saying that when they sat there and talked about operation moses in 19, 1984 and later on, Operation Solomon in 1991, that was a lie. It wasn't a success. They were not happy under the European Jews. All right? So we want that to be noted. Next slide, please, so we can get into what we're talking about in this particular aspect. Thank you. Thank you for that, my brother. The Jerusalem Chronicle Matter. The Ethiopian Hebrews have been second-class citizens similar to the black underclass in the United States, Jerusalem Chronicle 1996. Tensions between the Ethiopian Hebrews and Jewish authorities, European Jewish that is, have been pent up for several years now, like the black man and the police in the United States perhaps. When Israelis started to come some decades ago, we ourselves couldn't believe they were Jews who weren't black said the guy Adisu Masala, Jerusalem Chronicle, 1996. So he's saying that when they began to come, the European Jews um, began to go and see this report or so of the black Israelites in Ethiopia who are called Beta Yisrael by themselves, but are called Falasha in the Giz language by the, of the Kushites, that is, that basically means stranger, landless, or so forth, right? He, they were saying that we didn't know there were Jews in the world that weren't black. Let's understand that for a purpose, all right? Let's go, brothers and sisters, all right, into a particular aspect. I wanna show this right here. We're gonna go back to the slide that says, the Lord's Jews by Rappaport. The Symbolion is a key element in the mystery surrounding the philosopher's origins. Find the Symbolion and you will find the Lord's tribes of Israel according to legend. The river, the Sambatian is, they say, a mystical river. The river has been placed in America. So, China. So, Syria. Now, according to that, the Beta Yisrael speak of what is called the Sambatian River. And wherever that river is, is where the true house of Israel is, according to that teaching. So, let's see, taking it from that, then taking a so-called Falasha, a true Beta Israel stance reported, in 1996, Jerusalem Chronicle newspaper, it said when Israelis, that's the Europeans, the whites, started to come some decades ago, we ourselves couldn't believe there were Jews who weren't black. So let's understand what I'm saying. If the Beta Yisrael feeling, theology, opinion, stance, belief, teaching, if you will, if they're saying that America holds some of the lost tribes of Israel, and they're also saying that they, the Beta Israel, so-called Falasha, could not believe there were Jews who were not black. That means that the people that they're talking in America as being part of the Lord's tribes of Israel were black, or black. Let's understand what we're talking about so we can gain an understanding. These are the things we're talking about. The brother Josiah went over where it said the truth will come from the earth. This ain't racism, this is citations. All right, 
Next slide, please, brother, so we can gain an understanding of what we're talking about. All right? Thank you, my brother, for that. Adisu Masala. This is the guy that we were talking about. This is his picture right here that you see on the left-hand side. The Jerusalem Chronicle article that I got my citations from is pictured here on the right side. See, this is not things we're making up. You see the people that's pictured in there? They were or are alive. They either breathed or passed away by this point. May those who did rest in peace. This is over 20 years ago that we're talking about. There was an article, Israelites did have a newspaper called the Jerusalem Chronicle. And in 1996, this is something that we were talking about in this particular aspect, in this particular regard. So we can gain an understanding of what we are dealing with in this particular case. All right. Next slide, please, so we can gain some understanding of what we're talking about. All right. Thank you, my brother, for that. The Jerusalem Chronicle Matter and the pictures of the Beta Yisrael. Can you please tell me the difference between the so called Falashas who call themselves Beta Yisrael, as you see there, protesting with signs in Jerusalem and in the land of Israel, and what you saw with the Sean Bell protests, what you saw with the other people's protests? What's the difference between them protesting in the land of Israel? And we protesting over here in what we call the or what's called the United States. Israel was scattered from one end of the earth to the other. These are not things that we're making up. And over here, you see pictures of some of their females, some of their girls. All right. Beta Yisrael. And as stated, they are in a protest that says what? Stand up for your rights. All right. So use looking at them carefully. There's no difference between the sisters pictured there that are from the Beta Yisrael that no different than that come out of Brownville, Brooklyn, Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, Philly, South Chicago, D.C., Miami, South Central Los Angeles, as well as what you're talking about, Oakland, California. There is no difference when you're actually looking at these people than us over here in what we call the United States protesting physically and in spirit look at them then look at us and then the other side of us the sisters who go to school and go to college and able to learn something the same aspect that's going on with them in Ethiopia and Israel the land is the same thing our people are going through over here our solution is to return to the Mosai and keep his laws next slide so we can gain some understanding of what we're talking about thank you my brother All right, and it says this, the Jerusalem Chronicle in a matter of the pictures of B.I.s, meaning Beta Israel. The book I cited by Rappaport is pictured right there. The Lost Jews, last of the Ethiopian Falashas. All right, then you see um, whoever this European, I forgot the um, guy's name. I should have remembered it, but I forgot the guy in the suit. But then you look at them shaking hands with the Beta Yisrael. Israel. You know the laws of the Torah, or as you all in Beta Israel say, the Orit. Don't make any covenants with them. Learn from the black man in America when we thought we could make covenants with them. Just want to make that point because they don't keep their contracts. They don't keep their word, all right? So just want that to be noted. Next slide, please. Thank you, my brother, all right? It says a book, Ancient Israel, written by Michael Grant, all right? Herod made his way to Rome, where he met with Anthony. Anthony prompted the Roman government to make a treaty with Herod and sent him back to Judea, not as a prince, but as a king. This meant that the Hasmonean dynasty had been brought to an end in favor of Idumean house of unwelcome race and recent conversion. The Romans gave Herod this job. So what's going on? Herod, an Edomite, son of Antipater of Rome, all right? He decided to go and team up with the Romans. The Romans sent him back to be a leader in the land of Israel over the Israelites in power. All right. So we want this to be noted. Next slide, my brother. Thank you.
it says, Herod continued, the death of Cleopatra and Anthony made it necessary for Herod to protest loyalty to the victorious leader, later known as Augustus, who was in the times known as Octavian. Instead, when Herod died, Augustus divided his state between three of his sons. Archelaus was the person giving control over Judea. All right. So we just want to point that out for reference purposes. Now, next slide, my brother. Thank you. History of Israel by Michael Grant. Uh, he says the following. After urgent surrender in vain, Titus, that is to say the son of Vespasian, Titus pushed on with the siege. He succeeded in capturing the temple, which was consumed in flames. It should be noted that this temple destroyed was the temple. It should be noted that this temple destroyed was the temple that Ezra and them built in the time of the Persian rule. Anyone able to claim connection with the house of David was hunted down and eliminated. All right. So we just want that to be noted for edification purposes. All right. So, brothers and sisters, giving honor and praise unto Yah, creator, maker of heaven and earth. We're going to conclude in this particular aspect with the last six PowerPoints. And I entitled it Kasub, which is a nickname I picked for myself, Kasub's Explanation. It is obvious that we know of the onslaughts from the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, such as the mother and her sons murdered for not eating pork. We read of the situation with Rome and the Israelites starving to where they ate leather for food. Here is my question. Do the white Jews or the European Jews look for the family of Hadrian of Rome, the family of Antiochus of Greece, the family of Trajan of Rome, the family of Caligula of Rome, and hold them on trial for past war crimes as they do the old Nazis. Brothers and sisters, there was a Nazi man in the 1990s that was over the age of 90 that was incarcerated for four years for being part of the Jewish Holocaust. Point is this. They're very vindictive. So in them being vindictive, why is it that they don't try to find the descendants of the Greeks and the Romans that oppressed the Israelites and hold them on trial? It's because the European Jews know that they are not the Israelites that were oppressed by the Greeks and the Romans. So the blood tie, the king, the kinship is not going to make you want to do it. So European Jews will sit there and go hard and go vehemently strong in being vindictive against the Nazis, even to this day, if they get the opportunity. You understand? But they're not going to go hard against the Greeks and the Romans because they know that the Greeks and the Romans who oppressed the Israelites were friends with the Edomites. The Edomites mixing in with the European nations help produce the European Jews that you see of today. So these are things we want to point out for edification purposes. They are not going to sit there and look for the family of Antiochus, Hadrian, Trajan, or Caligula, or even Ptolemy I or Ptolemy II, or any of them, of the Greeks and Romans who oppressed the Israelites, because they are not the Israelites who were oppressed. All right. So we're going to go on. Next slide, please. Thank you, my brother, for that. They do not hold them on trial. Because the feeling of nationalism does not flow in the Jewish people concerning the house of Israel because they are not the house of Israel. They are, according to Stephen Jacobs, a white Jewish man himself, he stated in his book entitled Hebrew Heritage of Black Africa, he stated the European Jews are descendants of the Roman, Turkish, Armenian, and other Caucasian groups who adopted over the course of centuries what they refer to as the religion of Judaism. So this is what we want to point out for edification purposes. Okay, next slide, my brother. Thank you for that. Deuteronomy 28, verse 43. The stranger that is in the midst of thee shall get above thee higher and higher, and thou shalt come down lower and lower. He shall lend to thee, and thou shalt not lend to him. He shall be the head, and thou shalt be the tail. So we just want to point that out. Correct. Next slide. All right. Now, 
it says the stranger shall mount above the Israelites higher and higher. And the Israelites will come lower and lower. All right? Now, in a book entitled International Jew by Henry Ford, we see that this is said. The music industry, the cotton, oil, steel, magazine authorship, meat packing industry, the liquor business, the loan business are in control of Jews of the United States. Brothers and sisters, it says what? The music industry. Gangster rap was promoted by them. Tell sisters that they are female dogs. We're going to keep the language clean. All right? The cotton is in control of the Jewish people. Slavery records speak about by 1860, you already had European's economy being based off the cotton that was picked in the United States. But the businessman doesn't always be seen on the plantation. Give an example. The owner of Burger King doesn't sit inside of Burger King to eat. The Jewish man owned slave ships. The Jewish man was in charge of what happened in Liverpool in England when they was making the slave ships. And when you read about what is referred to as crypto Judaism, when they are Jewish by name, they change it to a Christian or a quote unquote regular name. So that way they can hide their quote unquote Jewish identity. So they were in part guilty of that. The music industry, the cotton, we know about the history with cotton and the black man. Okay. Oil, steel, magazine authorship, meat packing industry. The meat packing industry does include pork. Let's go on. The liquor business. You know there's liquor stores all over our community. The loan business. And when you go for a loan, who is the one who sits there and decides whether one gets it? The ones who set up the biggest banks from Chase to City Bank to all these other banks like that is in control of the Jewish people. They're the ones who give out the loans. The fact that they are in a position that they are in is not us, the black, the Israelites, hating on them. It's the fact to show that the Most High placed a plague and a curse on the true house of Israel. So if you're not able to identify with that because of the iniquities of ancient Israel, Israel fell. You became higher European Jew because the true house of Israel fell. As the brother Josiah read, the Most High will smite Israel, the true Israelites, where man is blindness and astonishment of heart. So because you're not blind to the history of what I'm talking about, that can't be you. The fact we got to go through 18 different references and all this other type of stuff just to show what it says in Psalms that the truth will come from the earth. And there's still going to be people, I don't know what that dude talking about. I don't know if that's accurate. But hey, maybe it's meant for another time or from another teacher through that work of the Most High for that brother or sister to see the light. All right? Let that be known. Our people don't loan nothing to nobody. We know that. We make up less. Correct me if I'm wrong. I may be wrong. As people of color, let's just take the United States. We own less in banking aspects, less than 4%, maybe less than 6%. It's certainly less than 10%. When they start talking about their big banks, nobody thinks about what are they going to sit there and get out of our community that is aspect of giving in as opposed to just taking out. Dave Chappelle made a comedy skit talking about um, reparations was given to black people and that Sprint was um, back into business and everything like that because that's what we do. We don't pay our bills and supposedly and so forth and so on. Understand that we are the people that are unfortunately become the tail and are not the head. All right. In order to get our position back, we got to return to the most high. So we want that to be noted. Next slide, my brother. Thank you. Deuteronomy 28, verse 68 in Hebrew, as you see here. What has she called he wa he mitzrayim? Ba aniyot, ba derek, asha amorti laka, lo tosif o lir ota, wa hit ma kartem sham, la oberka, la abadin, wa lish fa kot. So we just want that to be noted. Now, next slide, my brother. Thank you. So we can gain an understanding of what we're talking about. 
All right? Deuteronomy 28, verse 68. And the Lord shall send you back to Egypt in ships. By the way, which I spoke to you, you shall never see it again. And there you shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen, and no man shall buy you. So we just want that to be noted and what it's talking about. We went over many references about Israelites and where they were scattered at. All right. So this is just another depiction of it. And then the ships that took us to Egypt, the house of bondage. We're not talking about Egypt in literal North East Africa. So we just want that to be noted for edification purposes. Next slide, my brother. Thank you. What we're looking at here is called the slave trade and what actually happened. All right. To Brazil, then you had Dutch Caribbean, French Caribbean, British Caribbean, Spanish America, British North America. The majority of the people taken captive were taken to Brazil, all right? And then if you look in very meticulously, you see on the left-hand side picture that it's coming from East Africa also into Brazil by the Portuguese. What does that mean? That means good and well. All right. Saying that the Atlantic slave trade only went east can't be accurate. Because you got to be able to explain those that went to Brazil as captives. So we want this to be noted. I'm going to ask the brother, Josiah, Ben Levy, go and get the book that's there, brother, the black book that's on the top to, my, to the left. All right. Thank you, my friend. And it can't be seen, but I'm going to read part of this. So we want to get into this particular aspect right here. I have a book that I wrote. It's called Deuteronomy 28, 15 to 68, The Condition of the Blacks, History Untold to the Masses, ISBN number 978-158. Pardon me, 978-153-9008-798. Once again, the ISBN number is 978-153-9008-798. All right? That's for edification purposes. In this particular book, I spoke about the guy that they refer to as Munter, the Roman historian, because Israelites are being presented about this guy when we say Deuteronomy 2868 is concerning us as being captive. All right. But Munter, the Roman historian, says this. He says, in part, now that Betar had been captured, everything came under human control while Palestine, brackets, Judah was reduced to a desolate mound. Captives were sold into slavery in numbers too great to count. First, they were brought to the grand annual market at the Terebith Elo tree in Hebron, which is in the land of the east. Or, in the words of Haran Numus, to the tent o hell of Abraham near Hebron, each slave sold for the price of a horse. Those captives who were not sold there were brought to the marketplace in Gaza which because of the great multitude of slaves which were sold there were called Hadrian's Marketplace. And those who were still not sold there herded into ships and were taken to Egypt. Many died in transit, whether by starvation or by shipwreck, while many also were killed by cruel masters. Munter, Primodia, ECCL, Africana, page 85 and page 113. This is what is presented to us from many who say that we are wrong when we say that Deuteronomy 28 verse 68 is speaking about the Atlantic slave trade. They say, see, Munter said they were herded in ships and taken into Egypt. But you forgot to cite what you're citing correctly because he says, in quote, what? Does it say first they were brought to the grand annual market? So that's first. Then he goes on to say 
those captives that were not sold there. In other words, those were not sold in the grand annual market in Gaza, right? It says, and those who were still not sold there as in Gaza were herded into ships. So one of the things he says is he talks about those in Hebron. Then he talks about those in Gaza. Then he talks about those that were sold in either of those places were then herded into ships and taken into Egypt. Here's the question. The descendants of those that he spoke of in Hebron that were the captives and the descendants of those that he spoke of in Gaza that were the captives, where are their descendants today? The Most High will gather the house of Israel from winning of the earth even to the other. With that, shalom. Most High bless you and keep you. We're going to close out now with a prayer and move on from that particular aspect and case. Okay? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Most High, King of our forefathers, the God of Abraham, true, mighty, living and only. The God of Yiska, the one who sees all and is not seen. The God of Yisrael, the one who redeems, pardons, and forgives. We thank thee, O Yah, even for the knowledge of who you are and who we are. We thank thee, O Most High, for the knowledge of your laws, your statutes, and your commandments. We thank thee, O Most High, for food, clothing, and shelter. We thank thee, O Most High, for even guarding and shielding and protecting us from all things that are not good and advantageous for our well-being we ask thee O holy one of israel to even be with the elders of israel the sick and the infirm of the house of israel we ask thee to even be with and strengthen our brothers and sisters for there are many of even our sisters inside and throughout the prison system of this society throughout the length and breadth of the west indies throughout the length and breadth of south america a holy one of israel be with the tribes of israel that are scattered throughout the four winds of the earth a holy one of israel throughout north america central america throughout the caribbean throughout south america throughout the continent of africa and asia throughout the islands of the sea and throughout the place called europe a holy one of israel Bless those who know thee and those who know thee not and those who seek to know thee. Give them the light even as you have shed it to us and to our teachers and even to some of us who have children in this. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. I Amen. I All right. We got to press stop sharing, then press stop broadcast. All right. So.